everyone, and welcome to the Knighted Ones podcast, episode number 26. That's right, 26. Uh, I'm a little bit more animated now that I'm back this week, but thank you uh, to the team for uh, carrying the water as uh, a few of us were out uh, handling, you know, grown up things. Uh, we don't always get to focus on sports when we want to, um, but we're back. So we've got the full cast of uh characters and um as a reminder we are the only podcast that features a former ucf national champion a former ucf radio host a former ucf basketball player espn analyst and way too tall to get through a door frame uh well no he's still too tall to get through a door frame and several podcasts shooting the breeze talking UCF sports so welcome back to the show this week um Nobra's back as well so the production quality immediately went up so uh Nobra how are you doing this week doing good <laughs> yeah doing good it's good mm -hmm. not great where's your where's yeah, your I'm doing all right yeah didn't we establish an intro for you I kind oh, of bit you... off Josh's I still had yet well, to I Josh Josh bit off of you yeah and you bit off with someone else so i i think it was the other way around so i i don't know i don't know but isn't it supposed to be like hey hey now. hey hey now well there you go all right we'll we'll stay with that i'm gonna drop you off you gotta be ready for it next time bro <laughs> all right well. i'm glad you're back this week though glad to be back all right uh next to the stage our 2017 ucf national champion i'm wearing this shirt this week in his honor uh, listen, listen, y'all, y'all started off saying Josh, I bit off of Josh's. Y'all need to pause. That's the <laughs> crazy, that's a crazy <laughs> way to start the show. That's a crazy <laughs> way to start the show, man. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, well, see, that's why we have him come in last. So we can't bite off of Josh. It's the other way around. He bites off of us. So <laughs> pause. what is going on? <laughs> <laughs> oh man all right uh next let's go ahead and bring our our very own seven footer former ucf basketball player uh espn analyst uh and uh all around good guy who helps uh mothers in need to reach tall things <laughs> in publics uh ben stout welcome to the show what's up guys what's up yeah i we're, i feel like we're gonna have to Maybe change my uh, tagline at the bottom there uh, eventually because we don't have to explain it every single show. But uh, oh no, it's great. No, I don't know, maybe maybe fine. we'll keep it on until Publix gives me a sponsorship or give us a sponsor. Well, why do you think we're doing this? Come on, Publix, step it up. Like I, you know, at least a pub sub or something. You know, oh, I'll I mean, take that daily. Give me, give me, are you give me a strip sub with like ranch on it or or something. You know what I mean? Just throw me a bone here. <laughs> For um, sure. All right. Uh, welcome back to the show, Ben. You were out, uh, as was I, last week, so glad right. you're back. Uh, you and look hey, who hey. we have here, the, guy, the man who commandeered the show last week, Alan Levin. Alan, uh, thank you for, for covering for me uh, um, on kind of last-minute notice there. Uh, you guys did a great job, got lots of great comments. Um, but, yeah, remember, with Josh, it's – Last but not least, but always last. Last yep. but not least, but always last. I, I bought that one, but uh, happy that the whole crew's back and uh, excited for the show today. Me too. All right. Uh, speaking of Josh Lazar, last but not least, but always last, Josh Lazar. I'm not a biter. I'm a writer for myself and others. I do a big verse. I'm only big enough, oh. my brother. Oh, Listen. boy. Oh, boy. Oh, wow. That's on my intro. I'm is, not is a that, writer, I'm that, that's, I'm not no, no, no. Now you got to spit bars every time you get like introduced to the show. I mean, it's <laughs> that's that's not you just <laughs> you just screwed yourself with that because what more can any I say? Other intro that you do from this point forward is just not going to get to that level. So we'll call it <laughs> spit bars uh, with Josh Lazar. So <laughs> Josh is 16. We'll see. We'll see. Hey, All right. I'm, well, I'm welcome excited. back. To the show. Yeah, there's there's three more people here. This is great. Now we're yeah. all very tiny squares on YouTube. This is wonderful. Well, Nobra, Nobra won't won't be on here uh, for very much longer because you know he he uh, he makes sure he's the maestro and keeps us on track in the background uh, while he's eating his dinner after work. So, yeah. um, Nobra, uh, give give everybody a good uh, good hair shake and uh, let's get this thing rolling. The good, good hair. We never see Ben's hair because he's always got a hat on. So I'm, 
Josh, what do you know? Haircut recently, though, it's just uh, what you, what you know about Jay Z, Josh? Oh, come on! I, is, is that even a question at this point, Josh? Josh, I grew is up like, in what? New York. And, listen, if if you want to go old head, I grew up in the '90s in New York. When I went to the city, I got uh, tapes wrapped in neon paper and, and the swap marks. Okay, that's and 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 it's on the side. Yeah, I probably would kill a freestyle, uh, but not off the top. I'm not Harry Mack. So, but yeah. <laughs> so, I, I got so what you're flow. saying was you were you were three words. You were, you were Eminem before Eminem was Eminem. Is that what I just heard? No, no, no. Uh, it's uh, I, I, I qu could even think to be possibly even the space of that would be amazing. But no, I, I it, there is a lot of musicality in my background. I, I was <laughs> I, I sing Italian opera at, at points and arias, and I was uh, all state singer back in high school. But you know, like most amazing dreams they just go you know life in the gutter <laughs> now no. uh, all right never all right Italian so, opera yeah yeah so yeah. so here's the thing that we just learned about josh he was also uh in the running for the backstreet boys back in the day if you guys didn't know <laughs> uh you know he was he was definitely he was definitely i'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pause this for a second because i'm gonna do one uh, as long as you can let me run this hold on one second i gotta i gotta show you something oh <laughs> this is oh my gosh right? Dude, hold on, this, hold on. I got to get props. It's going to be bad. It's going to be bad. See this? Ooh, old school logo from UCF. Ooh. Okay. You got a trophy? What is that trophy for? Home Night coming. Night Karaoke Challenge. Karaoke UCF Challenge. Homecoming, 1999. First oh, yeah. What? Okay, that's impressive. That's legit. Josh turned into the world's most interesting man all of a sudden. <laughs> well, bro, he, does, he, does, he drops bars, these little all the time. It's it's just karaoke, like, man. You never cease to amaze me, Josh. All right. so, so hold on. Did you hang out with Glycerin, too, uh, at that time? Or what was going on? Because 99 yes. still had Glycerin. Yeah, that was – man, there's a picture of me on – not from that for something else. I was – it was when we did Spirit Splash. And there's a picture of me looking like – in an idiot from the nineties, to be honest. And it, with we Nitro and Glycerin like the on 90s. the seat. What? No, we didn't. <laughs> well, Dude, you I were like 12 in 90s. It was like a baby <laughs> in the nineties. Like, were you born in You're, the nineties? Were you? 96. I was born in 96. Exactly. Was a legit baby. I'll, I can tell you that. Okay, so I was probably crisscross wearing uh, uh, stuff backwards time frame, but. Hold on, um, hold, on no. hold on. What song won you the trophy? No, <laughs> question. So, so I only remember the two. Maybe there was three. I I do. My, my go to song is very very simple, and we'll uh, probably get a E for everyone on this. It's "Baby Got Back" by Sir Mix a Lot. <laughs> oh my, my goodness! Go to karaoke song that I kill <laughs> yeah. all the time. What? Back, back when I was single, love you, Teresa. Baby back when I was single. Back. Oh <laughs> I my goodness. My I throw my cell phone number in the chorus when I went back when I was single, and that that helped a little uh, wow. instead of what I did mix a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's my second money to see. That's that. my second uh, karaoke song there, Josh. I'm with you on that. So, yeah. so here's here's actually what won it though. That that just got me to the next round, and they had this big wheel. I, there might have been another song in the middle, but they had this big wheel, and you had to spin the songs of what you're going to sing. It was random. So I got um, Genie in a Bottle by Christina Aguilera. <laughs> wow. You sang Genie in a Bottle? I nailed Genie in a Bottle. <laughs> it, was, I, it, was, it was good. It was really, really good. Uh, and that's not me being uh, not humble brag. It was just, you, you have to recognize. So me in, in 99, I was probably about from this point forward, about 40 to 70 pounds heavier. Okay. And I had like I was full kind of metal head, Jenko jeans, silly hats, fans warp tour ish, like a whole thing. And I might have even had my fraternity right, jersey so, on. Hold on. So anyway. Next next show. <laughs> for next show, you've got to have a 90s era picture of I Josh don't. that we can show. I'll try. I really don't have any. Like there was one I remember. I, I don't really have any. Remember, this is still the 90s. It was like point and click and develop film. And uh, we didn't have cell phones with it. Uh, but yeah, so it was 
it it was i wish i kind of wish i had it because i mean it it wasn't good uh if you remember the 90s uh any of you a couple of you maybe um let's a little uh, bit yeah a little bit like we're talking the big era yeah, the, the big hats with weird fuzzy things that you got at Spencer's gifts or whatever, you know, the chain wallets and the big, big jeans. And I, I was I was a mess. I have no idea how I'm married right now, but uh, I am happily. Uh, oh, my my wife found like a uh, a gem in this odd little man. So God bless her. All right. Yeah, All right. All right. So we're going to bring Jose Guapo on here. Uh, what? I think. I think we might, we might have Jose Guapo coming on to the oh, show. God. So, Ooh. Um, yeah, we, uh, we had Joey, Joey Connors. We were trying to get him this week, the last couple of weeks. And uh, he, uh, you know, unfortunately, he wasn't able to make it last week. But it looks like he's going to be hopping on here with us. For those of you that don't remember Joey, you should. Uh, he played with us from 2015. So that's uh, Trey's era, right? Through twenty, oh, we can't. We can't. We came in together. Exactly. So you came in together. That's you just left boy. a little Ho early. Jose, did. Jose Guapo. Jose Guapo. That was his nickname. So he's a defensive lineman. He was number ninety-one. He's from Georgia as well. Um, but uh, he he had a little bit of a uh, uh, a little uh, around the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he yeah. Made definitely. Millions, man. He made a couple of people millions, man. <laughs> Yeah, well, they, yeah, I, I will tell you this, um, you know, that hit, I, I remember that hit. I thought there was no way that Burrow was getting up after that. I mean, uh, he just uh, he came out with smelling salts and all that. And we'll we'll uh, we'll when he comes on here in a few minutes, we'll we'll ask him about, about that, because I remember when I played football, the, the blind side block is the best uh type of hit you'll ever get because the person isn't expecting it so uh, i remember when i was in high school i knocked this one kid it was on on film too we were on the opposite side of the field we uh were returning a um it was either a fumble or an interception this kid was coming down with a full head of steam made sure to get my shoulder on the inside right uh so that it was legal but knocked him about like five yards into uh into his sideline and the coach, I just remember he walked up to him, looked down and just shook his head like that. And on the video, you can just hear that crack of the helmet, like all the way across <laughs> on the old nine, uh, on the old camera. So it was a lot of fun. I can imagine Joey felt really, really, really good after that one. So uh, he should be on here with us. Jose shortly. Guapo. What's up guys. What's up, Trey? Hey, up, he popped man? How you doing, man? <laughs> So excited to have you on this week. We were talking. We were talking a little bit about some of our favorite hits when we were uh, when we were playing. Because obviously you had a you had a mighty nasty one um, <laughs> on that one play, and and you knocked you knocked the football into Joe Burrow. So as a Bengals fan, thank you for that. Uh, hated it at the time, but I appreciate the uh, I appreciate that because you made that guy some millions on that hit. No problem. Yeah, it was a. Uh... It felt good in the moment, but probably uh, about three minutes later in the next quarter, it was not too good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. I can't believe – how did he get up from that? I swear I remember them going over and, like, throwing some smelling salts underneath, uh, underneath him to wake him up because I, I swear to God I thought he was knocked out. Yeah, um, I think uh, everybody thought he wasn't good enough. I thought he wasn't good enough, but he got up, and uh, I don't think he missed after that. No, he didn't. It was crazy. True. It was like – like, I don't know, I, you lay somebody out like that, you watch it, and then who was it that was over there with you that got us the penalty on that play? Nate. That was, was it Nate? Nate, yeah. Yeah, they he got us. Snack after. I don't um, blame him, though. I don't blame him. <laughs> I mean, I've been fired up after that hit. I can tell you that right now. That play shows up my Instagram, like, all the time, randomly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Joey – um, for those uh, those night fans, because you know, uh, one of the good things about our our success and a lot of the success that you guys drove was we we have a lot of younger fans on that may not remember 
you from uh, your years here. You started off like Trey in 2015, which I was there for a lot of those games and uh, not very many other people <laughs> were. But, uh, you know, coming out of that George O'Leary time frame and then moving on, you know, under Scott Frost and, um, you know, and then this run of success. Tell them a little bit about your journey, how you got to UCF, um, you know, and, and what was it like in those early days in 2015? What, and, you know, Trey likes to tell the story of why he came uh, uh, to UCF. I'd love to hear that from you, too. Yeah, uh, originally from right outside of uh, Atlanta, Georgia, um, with Trey, both Georgia boys. Uh, went to Harrison High School and uh, Coach Key, Brent Key, recruit, who's now the head coach at Tech, um, recruited me down there um, to UCF. And um, I'm originally from, you know, was born in Clearwater, got a bunch of family that was living in near the Orlando area. Um, and, you know, growing up and then getting in high school, I've always wanted to go play football um, back down in Florida somewhere. So that was just one of my goals. Uh, both my parents graduated from Florida State. So that was kind of the dream school growing up. But, you know, they didn't even look at me or recruit me. Um, so one day just UCF reached out to me and um, Coach Key got me down there on a visit and offered me kind of on the spot and probably a couple months later I committed and kind of, you know, it was one of those things once I got there, saw the campus, went on the campus tour, saw the dorms, saw the facilities, you know, it was one of those things where I knew that was home. Um, That's and, funny because because Trey mentions that too, like about the facilities oh, yeah. and and more specifically about the dorms and stuff. And, you know, everybody knows all of that's relatively new and the way that it's set up where you're right there by the facilities, mm -hmm. that's convenient. Um, did you go on any other visits or um, any other schools and you were like comparing and like, oh, this is way better than that school? Uh, I went on a couple unofficial visits, but uh, Coach O'Leary was pretty old school and uh uh, did decide not to go on anymore, so I made sure I had my scholarship to UCF. <laughs> yeah, his, his thing was you shop, we shop. Uh, yeah, yep. And uh, I remember too, he always told all the uh players that uh, don't commit unless you're actually ready to commit, exactly. So, yeah, I made sure to not go anywhere else. And once I committed to UCF, I was all in and stayed committed. And I know in our class, I think our class pretty much stayed together, you know, for four, you know, four, three, four years. So, you know, it was a good thing. And we had a really good class that came in and, you know, was able to win a conference championship my first year, you know, which was fun. Yeah, it's it's way different now. Right. Uh, guys yeah. hop around. Um, you don't it's different for fans, too. And I'm sure you see this now that you're outside of the locker room. Right. Um I remember back in those days and we've talked about it with Trey, we do fan fest and we go hang out on the, uh, you know, on the, on the practice fields or whatever after fan fest and everybody be out there, all the freshmen and sophomores, mm -hmm. you just got to know people and, and got to watch them succeed and, and continue through the program and root for them as they kind of developed. And um, unfortunately you just, you don't get that as much anymore with the transfer portal and, and everything else that's going on. Everybody's moving around. So uh, that's one thing I, I kind of miss. Um, obviously, we know who the white horse is. Uh, we know um, a, a lot about him. I, I actually got it. O'Leary was kind of interesting because if you got him outside of like coaching or, or by himself, he was a different person uh, when you got to talk mm -hmm. to him that way. Right. What are yeah, some stories that. about your time then uh, with Coach O'Leary that kind of stick out to you or, or might be memorable? Uh, I would say the, you know, like you just said, um, outside the practice field, I thought he was one of the greatest guys and just took care of you. I mean, I felt like, you know, obviously everybody has the stories of coach O'Leary and I mean, I'm sure Trey's probably told a bunch, but he generally cared for, you know, us off the field and looked after our best interests. Um, like you just said now on the field. Yeah. He was going to make sure to bring out the, you know, the best in you, you know, going back to Friday morning workouts and our red shirt year. Woo! You know, doing fair, fair crawls, running the stadium, doing lunges, doing sleds, um, that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, probably the, the, the best one, you know, is pro is like this is probably this is my retro freshman year. Get pulled up. I think it was like two lane week, you know, got put on scout team. You know, my retro freshman year is kind of down and then get pulled up. And uh, he was big defensive guy, as we all know. Um, everybody knows Coach O'Leary's a big defensive guy and. 
you know, you look over, you see the signal for the defense, and you go back to the play, and there's one play where he thought I didn't look, and he stopped just the entire practice, just called me out, came over, got in my face, and made sure I got the signal. Um, so there, I did not miss another signal after that. So that's probably the best story. But, I mean, like you just said, you know, generally probably one of the, I'd say, off the field, just guys that generally would, would take care of you um, if you needed anything. I still remember he came back to a practice. I think it was, uh, I think it was Coach Frost. I mean, Trey might know. Is it Frost? I don't know. I don't think it was. Yeah, Trey. yeah, yeah. It was Frost. Um, yeah. Frost. And he came back and he watched like, you know, watched like five or six plays. And I got out of the rotation and came and saw him, said, what's up? And of course, you know, first thing he said is, you know, your stance is wrong. You got to do this. You got to do that. <laughs> and then, of course, like five minutes later, oh, how's your family doing? You know, so he's yeah. still, the coach was still inside of him still trying to coach me up even when he was done and then but obviously still I asked about my family my mom and all that so but you know grateful he was one that gave me the opportunity to go down there and you know I wouldn't be you know where I am right now in my profession um, without him for sure so so were were you the recipient of the ace or what nickname did he have for you I think everybody was shooting of the ace <laughs> everybody at some, point, at some point at some point in their career if you played for coach O'Leary, you got it at some point everybody uh, yeah it uh he he was uh he's a colorful character but he he always took time uh one-on-one -on -one, even with you know people that were there with families or fans or whatever he always made sure to do that kind of stuff and that's just who he was and you know if you have a conversation he was it, people don't i mean i think people some get it somewhat get it because like when he was in interviews or whatever he always said something off the wall hilarious right so like he he had a lot of humor to him and um he he was a lot of fun josh had something josh what did you want to say yeah so so and i know we are sports podcast but i think even trey and joey night hey, joey nice to see you uh <laughs> maybe maybe uh what is so understated is o'leary's dedication to that uh to the student part of the student athlete uh, he, he, I remember like there was a class, I, I'll, I'll be very general for, for regulations, all that. There was a class where a lot of students are in. It's a class that a lot of students are in right now. And something was going on with the student part of the student athlete. And he, he, not, not ASSA. He asked personally to figure to have us have a conversation with him to make sure the students are getting the education they need. Like it was it. He was a lot of things. And he was he's I don't know about the football side, but on the academic side, he was really, really, really dedicated to making sure everyone graduated, did well in class, attended class and, and did all that. So, I mean, I know we talk sports all the time, but as, as someone who is an educator and has been in that space for a long, long time, I, that shouldn't be. That, that should be really clearly stated alongside of his his kind of reputation here at UCF. Yeah, Josh, um, if you didn't know Joey, which you didn't because Josh didn't say that, he's a professor at UCF. So that's why it's all of the academics <laughs> is it's super I important. It. But, uh, I was an but, adjunct for like 18 years, so I've been around. Yeah, he yeah, might have been my student. I don't even know. <laughs> so – you know, yeah, the academic side, that was definitely something for him. He also made sure people um, had scholarships. If they left the program early to go to the NFL, they could still come mm -hmm. back and get their degrees. Kevin Smith took advantage of that. Um, a bunch of different people did. Um, that 2013 team, what did that mean to you? Were you aware of them at the time? Um, you know, I know Trey talks about it a lot, how it was a foundational team for a lot of the players that were coming in. What, is that really when – when uh, UCF got on your radar? Uh, I would say, yeah, I mean, that definitely put them on there. But I knew, you know, I kind of knew of UCF, I'd say. I mean, I was at that time, I believe I was already committed. Um, so I knew them. But I think people and like, I mean, Trey might know too, like up in Georgia where I was from. Um, even, you know, I'm sure even, you know, you go to Alabama and you go, they didn't know who UCF was. And then once I think they beat that Baylor team, it kind of put them on the map, I think, for everybody to see them. You know, not just, I think, us, you know, as fans and players and recruits, but I think that put them for the whole world. Once they kind of upset Baylor, uh, what do they went in there without their D.C., you know, had all, you know, Baylor had all this high-powered offense, and they go up there and put all those points up. So I think that game alone just put them on notice for everybody and put UCF on the map. 
Yeah. Yeah. What, um, one of the things I wanted to talk about, we've kind of talked a lot, you know, once we transition to um, Scott Frost, right? We talk a lot about uh, 2016 and 2017, but Trey um, decided to go to school um, somewhere else. Um, so we don't talk about that very much, but that, that UCF football experience for that second undefeated year. Right. So we, we, we really, yeah. we really don't have a lot of, uh, feedback, uh, from Trey on that. And I'd love to hear your take on, you know, just that transition to Frost and what that meant to you, um, as a, as a player. And then also kind of walk us through 2018 and what that was like heading into the season with those expectations, knowing you had a target on your back. You know, um, having, you know, having, you know, as you progress through the season, realizing that, hey, we we might go undefeated again. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, obviously the loss of KZ and how that uh, affected you as a as a member of the team. Yeah. You know, you know, from going from, uh, you know, from uh, O'Leary to Frost, I think Trey Press probably talked about it. It's just a, a, you know, fresh air almost like it was something new for us and it was something I think we really needed, you know, just because kids, you know, nowadays are way different than how they were, you know, 10 years ago, just the way it is. Um, so we just, that new, just fresh and how coach Frost was, you know, first week going there, start working out with us, power cleaning 315, like it was nothing, and just nothing. Run, going out on the track, running a mile, like in, in four minutes, you know, I can think, I can like it was nothing. So <laughs> it was just something different, you know, running scout team quarterback and doing all, it was just something I think we needed because we never, you know, had that in the years, you know, with Coach O'Leary. So I think that was just a huge thing that Coach Frost did. And then obviously transitioning um, to Coach Heupel, obviously that's a it's a big, big uh, deal going undefeated. Then you have to come in and try to, you know, do it again as a new head coach. So that was probably a tough situation out he was in, but he handled it really well. You know, after uh, – we beat upset Memphis and not upset after we beat Memphis and all that, you know, Danny White called us on office, asked us what we wanted. And, you know, so we told him exactly what we wanted. All the offense guys wanted high tempo, high power, a yep. lot of points, all that. And, you know, defense, we said what we wanted. And then coach Heifel got hired, um, came into a team meeting, got hired. Um, we were kind of like a little bit shocked because nobody really saw it coming. Cause obviously everybody has, we all know social media now. So you see all these rumors and, Nobody saw that at all, um, but he did a really good way. I think like within the first, you know, we coach Hypel had every, you know, every class over to his house, you know, with open arms mm -hmm. and had a, had a dinner with every single class and had a pool party, you know, so you had every single player, you know, in that building came over his house and saw him how he interacted with his kids, with his family, which I thought was important. And then, you know, within the next month, he made all the position coaches, you know, take, uh, another position out for dinner. So I went and golfing with the, you know, OC and the running back coach, you know, as a D lineman. So he did stuff like that, you know, so, you know, coach hype was great. I think he did the right way. Obviously he was offensive minded, you know, but he showed a lot of love to the defense. Um, but I think that helped the transition and helped us buy in. And then, you know, we had such a tight knit group, I think with our class and it led down to some of the class below us that that 2018 we had so much confidence we were rolling you know you could probably ask anybody in that class even the year before uh every game we went and think we were winning there was like no doubt in our mind we didn't care you who we put up like we were winning that game and that's the confidence we have and i tell people all the time now i'm coaching and confidence is a crazy thing you know yeah. it, 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 yeah, it, man. But, you know down 15 against memphis twice whatever it was we like if you looked, if you came to the locker room, you thought we were winning by two touchdowns because we just knew we were going to come back. Like we didn't, we were like, yeah, whatever, we'll come back and win. So <laughs> well, that's, you're right. Though. Crazy thing. Joey, we, we were talking about sidelines all season last season, right? Mm -hmm. What the sidelines yep. looked like, how dead they were. Like there wasn't any, anybody that were current players that were sitting there and motivating the other players, right? Uh, you didn't have the, um bowling pin celebrations or any of that kind of stuff that that were going on in 2017 and 2018 <laughs> and i think that's that's been a huge difference uh for last year's team and you heard gus talk about that this year as well as how they're trying to change that mentality and really foster that leadership amongst the team um so that they're motivated and you know bringing um 
bringing in a no, new OC that really is is centered around building that culture and that toughness mentality. Trey talked a lot about how um, you know the the advantage for that 2017-2018 team was you had a lot of O'Leary players who had the O'Leary fundamentals on how to you know practice how to uh the effort that needs to be put in while at the same time you got frost who came in and brought his way of doing things and hypo as well which were a little more lenient but that mix of having both is what led to a lot of that success um how do you feel about that do you think really that was a big difference ma uh, maker for that team yeah i think it was huge and i think that you know it was it was a very and that's the biggest thing is like Coach O'Leary was big fundamentals, obviously, you know, being the big, big, big fundamentals effort, you're going to run to the ball. And then I think you're exact coach Frost, like we said, it was something different and it was have fun doing what we're doing. Like we're up here spending all this time doing this. We're putting all these hours in these workouts and fall camp and we might as well have fun with it. You know, and don't get me wrong. We had fun, you know, playing my first two years when I was with coach O'Leary, not so much the second year when uh, we know what happened. That <laughs> <laughs> but we uh, all understand that. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, if you probably ask all the guys that came in with me and, you know, I think without Coach O'Leary, you know, having that background of fundamentals and the way he coached us and all that, you know, we probably don't go undefeated without that, you know, going into those next years with Coach Frost and all that, just because of how he was. And we knew we, you know, whatever coach they were bringing in and Trey could probably tell us is like, we've been through the hardest stuff we've ever, like, no, nothing can ever. Be this. I, was, I literally tell him, like, Bro, we were in the, those first two years. I felt like I'm like, I should have joined the military. At least I'd get paid to do this. Like, holy smokes. That's the strongest I've ever felt. My upper body felt great. <laughs> ever. Oh, my gosh. Funny. But, like, I remember the funniest thing for me, like, just about Joey was when we were our freshman year, we just got dropped off. I think, you know, we're freshmen. We're excited. So we all go out on the track. So we're like, yeah, let's see who's faster. So everybody's racing. Everybody. Boom, boom. <laughs> I raced Chris Williams and Kyle Gibson and all that. And all of a sudden, Joey's like, hey, CJ, because they were roommates. CJ, race me. CJ Jones was a running back. Mind you, Joey is a defensive lineman. Right. <laughs> so we're like, we're like, is this guy crazy? Joey beats him in the 40-yard dash. And I was like, when I saw that, I said, oh, yeah, he's going to be good. Because if he can run like this, all he has to do is put on weight. And he's got it. I mean, it was just seeing him run. I mean, we all talk about the like the hit and – the big hit on Joe Burrow and stuff like that. But like I, we saw Joey or at least me, I saw him like work and grow. And like, you know, he went from, I think he was, you were what, like 230, 240 when you came in. Like yeah, a, was, you, were, you were a big dude, but you were like compared to what you got to. I, like I saw the work bigger. and you see how explosive. And I used to talk to like coach Duval. I'm like, Joey is explosive for a defensive lineman. And I mean, it's, it's those are always like the cool stories. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, you get to see just, the growth of guys and you know from when we first i came in there with him i was a stick you know he was a bigger guy but compared to where he finished we both finished we gained a lot of weight and i mean again that was yeah we we say it because of coach o'leary man that those nitros meals and those 10 <laughs> sets of 10s on those friday morning 10 sets of 10s used to that that's that's what the foundation was at least for for me and him um because that's all we knew you know it was you guys aren't playing so you got to get stronger you got to get bigger so. And we talk and we talk about it like you know now I'm I'm in the coaching role even now, mm -hmm. um, and it's like you don't see red shirts that often now that like do that like you know like Trey said I went in at like 250 White Miller went in at like 260 whatever yeah, he man, was you know, all these guys and we knew but going in we knew we got to go we got a red shirt we got to get bigger stronger faster yeah. do all that and then we all exactly. end up being we all end up playing you know for three four years after that you know exactly now, you know it's the way college football works if you want a red shirt you know that kid might just transfer you just don't know yep it's a different world man i say that every week i don't yep. i don't understand it i i can't i can't really talk to it i, I just hear from like you and you know and Brim, the guys in the coaching field i'm like how do you guys deal with this because this wasn't you know they recruited me they say hey you might play but you're most likely gonna red shirt because you got to get mm -hmm. bigger physically and yep and then wait your turn and you know, there's a beauty in that process. You know, nowadays, kids are like, "Man, put I'm I'm a baller. Put me in now, or I'm leaving." Yeah. You know, and it's a tough thing. I I, I couldn't imagine dealing with that. And that probably attests with how tight our group was, our age. You know, because yeah. we we knew, okay, you know, even the guys that are year above us, like Tony, was going through those Friday morning workouts. Yeah, the team exactly. was. They're all with. Takeem, they're all with us. Yeah. My, like people don't realize, like my freshman year, 
if you look at our scout team freshman year, that was the twenty. The whole what, 20, that was yeah. the yes, that was, that the, was defense. the yeah, that was the twenty seventeen defense. You know, we had we Shaquille, were all we had, scout team. Yeah, we were all scout team, but like we knew we had each other back. We knew we literally have gone. We've done a we had to do a push up every yard line on the end door, like up down every five yards. We knew we did all that stuff together. Bear crawl that. every five yard, yeah. bro. It was. Uh, I'm I telling you, this. like when when Frost and them used to come in and be like, "Y'all don't think this is hard." We're like, "Coach, you don't understand what we were doing." Like, I yeah. wish you could have seen what we were doing because this is a walk on the park. Like, I'll do this every day. Like, come call me on Saturday, Sunday. We'll do it. Like this. Hold what, on, what was it four, four quarters. Four quarters, bro. That was a cake. <laughs> yeah. So Joey, so Joey, I played basketball in the early 2000s. So Trey's heard me tell the story of being on the basketball team when O'Leary came in, and so y'all, y'all, y'all were thrown into the deep end, you know, as mm-hmm. freshmen with O'Leary. But then you got to transition to somebody like Frost, which was a little bit better. But those guys, they they did the opposite. The guys in the early 2000s, they did the opposite. They went from a <laughs> player's coach and Coach Kruzek to O'Leary. And uh, Trey's, Trey's heard me tell the story of being on the basketball team and and just seeing uh, in the summer, in the fall, like uh, O'Leary coming in there. Actually, I should say the spring when O'Leary got hired, right, yeah. right as he got hired, you know, basically O'Leary coming in trying to make people quit. And it was mm-hmm. – uh, and that was an interesting time in the early 2000s. If you were <laughs> the Wayne Dench, right when they built the new Wayne Dench, um, I still call it the oh, new air Wayne conditioning. Dench. By the way, that's that's awesome. Awesome. oh, we didn't we didn't have air conditioning our first two years until Frost got there. Right, right. And I so, know. So yeah, I mean that was that was a crazy transition. Uh, but one of the questions I wanted to ask you, actually, Joey, as you were talking about that 2018 team, and it was, and to be honest with you, is pretty refreshing. Um, to hear you talk about how Heifel came in and had different position groups um, bring out, um, you know, bring out the guys from an, from another position group um, and hearing about how involved Heifel was with at least the defensive players, if not the defensive, you know, uh, game plan, mm-hmm. if you will. Because one of the things from an outsider's perspective or a fan's perspective of the, of the Heifel time at UCF is that, Randy Shannon got hired before Heupel, right? So everybody said, well, Heupel, Heupel now at Tennessee kind of is, is able to, for the first time, when he, when he got hired at Tennessee, kind of for the first time was able to be the kind of like true head coach of a program. And again, this is just an outsider's or a fan's perspective. Um, and so, so how was that with, between Randy Shannon and Josh Heupel as far as just the the dynamic of because at least the perception was at that time that Randy Shannon was essentially the head coach Mm -hmm. of the defense and Josh Heupel was the head coach not of the program but of the offense and so was that perception a little bit of reality or was it just fans and 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 other people talking I think it was a, a lot of fans in a way um you know, but you, you obviously you see all that. Um, but no, I think, you know, it worked out great. Um, you know, my opinion, it was, I think people see that, you know, I think now even in the coach world, like you go against each other during fall camp, you go into their spring ball, like those in DC are going to go up against each other. But there, I will say those, you know, both of those guys generally care about the players. It's one thing I think they had in common. Like right when I got done playing, Coach Shannon would text me all the time if I needed something. You know, if I needed something this, now being in the coach world, if I needed a recommendation, he'd call somebody. Same with Coach Heupel. If I ever needed anything, right when he knew I would get into the coaching world, he made phone calls for me. You know, he found out I was getting married, you know, I think two years ago. And, you know, he sent me a wedding present that showed up randomly at my door. You know, got my address and sent me a wedding present, just stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, both of them, they generally – care you know for the players and you could see that through both of them now you could see that they were both very competitive they both wanted to win and you could see that during fall camp and you could see that during spring ball (laughs) that's that's funny because you know one of the things i think from a fan's perspective you know when everything went down and otis spoke or when with otis and he spoke at uh, otis's funeral i think a lot of people really realized how much he actually did care and up until that Mm -hmm. point um, from an outsider's perspective, I don't, I don't feel that people really gave him credit for that. Right. And, and 
I think that was really the divining point, but it's good to hear it from your perspective too, mm -hmm. having been on that 2018 Scott, because that wasn't an easy position for him to come into at all. I, the, mean, I think that was the hardest job in the country. 100%. Yeah, you come, you, you come in after Frost and all those expectations and the undefeated season and all that other stuff. And you've got this team now that you've got to take control of. You've got new head, you got new defensive coaches. There wasn't any consistency in the coaching. I mean, he, that, let's be real. Frost took all of the coaching staff with him, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, you guys one. were literally starting from scratch. And, you know, what I had always uh, heard was that basically he said that first year, um, I'm going to take pieces and try to continue on as much as he could instead of putting his own system in, try to uh, adjust his system to try to continue on that success. And I think he did that, navigated that successfully, um, you know, to me. Um, so one thing, I'm just going to throw this as an anecdote, and this, you know, you can take this serious or you can't. Uh, but one of the things from the outside perspective was second half Randy. Um, you know, that, uh, that, that those speeches must have been like, uh, like, Amazing. So the half -time in the second half, and why do you guys think you played so much better in the second half defensively than the first? I'm beyond. I mean, we didn't make any, I, from what I remember, obviously it was a long time ago. Well, it feels like a long time ago. Um, we didn't make any <laughs> crazy adjustments. I think it goes back to when I was talking about confidence. When I'm telling you, like we could be down fit. We had the confidence that we would beat anybody. It did not matter who, like we would go play anybody. We thought we'd beat anybody. So at halftime, I think one thing Coach Shannon did really, really good at is no matter what the score was, no matter if we're winning by 30, winning by 40, he always kept his composure. Like, he never showed like he was stressing. So I, I don't think that it did it, the stress didn't come. Didn't, he didn't go up there at halftime and start freaking out saying, we got to have pitch a second half shutout, or else we're not winning. You know, never once that he showed any type of stress. He was calm. And, you know, if we had to make adjustments, he goes, these, these are the little things we got to do, guys. Oh, we, we got to tackle better. We got to create turnover, too, and we're going to win a game. We'll be fine. But I think during those halftime adjustments, he was just very calm. Like, and told, you know, he always – and he would always put confidence in us. You know, that's the one thing I think he did a really, really good job with is he would pump confidence into the players. And I think that you should, you saw that, you know, throughout the – and he was the same way at halftime. He was calm. He would give us confidence. And I don't know what it was, but – Sure enough, go out and shut teams out in the second half. We like <laughs> to make things interesting, I guess, the second year. <laughs> so, you know, from a scheme perspective, right, um, you guys were going to a new coaching staff, and obviously Coach Chins, uh, he had a, a very different defensive style than what O'Leary did. Uh, he was more about getting turnovers for possessions because we knew we had a high off, uh, uh, a high scoring offense, which, number one, must have wore you guys out. I can't imagine – uh, being mm -hmm. on that team with as many times you had, I played defense and being on the field that many for that many reps, that would have wore me out. Um, but you know, when we're, when we start talking about, um, you know, defensive scheme, did he dial back the scheme a little bit for you guys, uh, when he came in just because he's a new coach and they're trying to, um, you know, get you used to him as a coach or, or his scheme? No, Coach Shannon, no. I mean, we were – I thought we were more aggressive with him. When it comes to blitzing and we were three down, we were four down, we were doing, we were always moving as D linemen. Um, so I felt like we were more aggressive. Um, I think one thing as a staff they did, they tried to get to know all of us first, and then I think they kind of saw what we could handle, and then they, you know, put in their scheme. Um, but we were a pretty, I would say, veteran group. I mean – now, the year before, the 2017, you know, Trey in the Peach Bowl year, we lost a lot. I mean, when you look at our starting group, we lost a lot that people don't see. Um, when you look down the line, we lost a lot of players. Um, but we had a lot of smart players, and, you know, we had Pat at linebacker. Very kind of smart. Carried, we had Pat who carried the linebacker group. We had, you know, me on the D-line. And then we had in the safety, we had Kyle and Richie Grant, who's probably one of the, you know, smarter safeties that you'll ever, you know, meet. So, you know, and then at corner, you have Novell, who had a bunch of reps and, you know, we had a bunch of really smart football players, so they knew we could handle it. So I think they were pretty aggressive with the install and getting it in and, you know, going forward. I th So I thought it worked out great, you know. But he was a very – I'll say his defense was a very aggressive because we were going three down, four down. We were busting all over the place. Stunning. Yeah. I remember. I yeah. did a lot. 
Yeah, I remember. I remember too. You know, one of the things people forget is that defense is complementary too, right? If you've got a good secondary, it may, it allows you to be more aggressive with uh, mm-hmm. the D line, right? So you can really get after the quarterback. And um, I, I remember a lot of that uh, from that year as well. Let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, KZ and and when that all went down and and what that was like for you as a player. Um, obviously, for us. It was crazy because I, I remember during that game, I was watching it on TV um, because I was out of town. And I was telling the person that I was with, I'm like, he's got to quit running. Uh, for, just mm-hmm. get down, get out. Like, it's we're too close to uh, uh, to the next game and, and the potential for, you know, another undefeated season. What did that feel like for you guys uh, while you were there? Can you kind of talk us through what it was like on the field when he went through that? Yeah, I mean, on the field, it was complete shock. Um, None of us really wanted to believe it, you know, my opinion. And then, you know, him getting off Carter the field was a unreal feeling. You know, it was awful. Um, Now, at the same time, we knew that there was a game to be played because it was early on the game. But I think in that moment when the cart was there and all that, we were all, if you look all, I think in the whole sideline, we were in complete shock. Um, And I think, I don't, I don't know if it was Coach Heupel or one of the seniors gathered everybody up and kind of, you know, hey, if, you know, KZ will want us to go out and win this game. That's what he'll want us to do. Um, so we all thought about that. And then, but, you know, when you go into the locker room after the game, you know, you just beat USF, you know, you usually you're celebrating, getting a picture with the trophy, all that. But it wasn't like that at all. It was, I think, I'd say probably 75% of the locker room was crying. In tears, calling KZ, trying to see if he's good, calling his parents. I mean, it wasn't celebrating a win over USF and going to the conference championship, it was people were crying and checking in on KZ and calling, trying to see if he was all right. How did, um, did you guys, how much did you know? Like, did you know how bad it really was that it was life threatening and, um, and everything like during the game or shortly thereafter? When did you guys find that out? Uh, during the game, we had no clue. Um, we had no clue what was going on during the game. Uh, it wasn't until after the game where, we got a little bit of update, but we didn't know how you know severe it was. Um, they updated us a little bit, and I mean, we kind of knew it was bad. When you bring out the air cast and everything else on the field, we you're getting card off. We know it's bad. But we know it was the extent of obviously what the injury was um, after the game. So you guys go into the conference championship that year, um, and you don't have your your starter. Uh, you don't have your starting QB. And the guy who comes in replaces it plays the game of his life, right? Like it, how did, how did that, how did you guys feel going into that game? Were you confident uh, in his ability to do that? Um, you know, how did you, how did you feel throughout the game and, and, you know, watching him play? Cause I've watched him play a lot. Mm-hmm. I wasn't expecting the way that he performed. How, how did that um, motivate you guys? What were you guys thinking going into the game, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, uh, going into the game, there was obviously a lot going on with KZ and everything, but we all knew, you know, we've watched DJ practice. We watched him, what he did. I mean, he's a big guy, and we knew he could run the ball, obviously, when you saw what he did. Um, but also, we, we've seen what he could do with his arm. I mean, he has an arm on him, and he could throw it. So we had confidence that he was going to go in and, you know, play really well. Um, and – You know, first half uh, turnovers, I think if you don't, you know, if we don't have those turnovers, it's probably we're winning that game by a touchdown or two going into, I mean, you know, up by a touchdown or two going into half um, instead of where we were. Um, And we knew in the second half defensively we would play a lot better. I mean, I think we gave up probably over 200 yards rushing on defense in the first half. Um, So we knew it was on the defense. And I think what, what, you know, really is the seniors kind of stepped up, talked and, you know, like we always talk about the senior leadership with Wyatt on the other side. Um, he was a big deal. Then you have Pat and Kyle and all the other guys on the defense that, you know, came together. Like, you know, we got to, if we're going to win this game defensively, we got to do something. Um, and obviously, we we're able to force a turnover at the very end and have a couple stops. And um, I always knew with our offense, if we can get a couple stops, we're going to win the game. And that's kind of what happened in that second half. Um, but we always had faith in uh, DJ. We always knew he was going to go do well. Um, we watched him during practice. You know, we see it. We get, <laughs> yeah. So we get to, you know, that's what, you know, it's hard for the fans. You don't get to see what some of these guys do at practice, the backup quarterbacks, or if it's a, 
receiver that comes out of nowhere, like you know, Trey can attest to this. Like we always knew Gabe Davis was gonna be a dude. Like come to that come to the to summer come to his first summer workout and watch what that guy does. He was gonna be a dude. So it's like, you know, for fans it's hard to see. You know, you can't see that, but you know, we all see that as players. So we knew, uh, yeah. go ahead. No, I was gonna say we knew all those freshmen were gonna be good. Like him, Marlon, Otis, like those were some some different kind of freshmen when they came in. Like, yeah. we're like, oh, yeah, they're going to play, and they're going to make a lot of plays. So you go into – you you win the conference championship game, and now you're going to go play LSU. Um, what was the thought process and game plan going in uh, to LSU? And it felt like you had all the confidence in the world uh, up until that hit. And then there was – and it wasn't even the hit. It, it felt like after that penalty, the win – got knocked out of our sails a little bit. Um, and it was still a close game. People forget uh, mm. that was still a close game, even with the loss. Um, t- take us through like what, what your mindset was going and the strategy was going into the game. And then kind of what happened after that penalty and, and uh, what the mindset was after that. Yeah. I mean, uh, going into the game, I think it was like every game we played in the season, it was just another game. Um, obviously they're, LSU coming from the SEC, so they got, you know, some some different uh, athletes over there. I think, you know, that offense, that the running back, quarterback, like through, they all went first round, center went like second round. Um, so they had some different dudes on that team. Um, but at the time, we were just treating it like every other game. You know, we had the same scouting report that we do every game. Um, so we had a lot of confidence and, you know, I felt like we had a pretty good week out there in Arizona, um, good week of preparation, all that. So we were feeling going in and then, um, you know, first drive, they returned the kick and then we hold them to a field goal. Um, so we, you know, defensively, we were pretty confident, you know, for them to get a long kick return. I think it was almost down to like the 10 yard line. And then we hold them to three points. So defense, we were confident. And, you know, then our offense goes down and score and then they drive on us and then we get to pick six and we go up 14, um, three. And yeah, then the hit happened. And I think honestly, if you look at that game, there were some key penalties that set us back um, yeah, in, cr- in critical moments um, that could, I think, I think could have changed the game completely. And then, you know, sometimes they got some better athletes, you know, in positions that kind of hurt us and hurt us in certain spots. And, you know, obviously they have they had like six first rounders. So, you know, it was tough at that point. But at the same time, I think there's a couple of penalties there that I think if you take those away, obviously, and like you just said, like we lost by eight points. People act like we, we lost by 21. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was uh, – and, and that team, I mean, the expectations were high for that LSU team going into it. And obviously, mm-hmm. we didn't have KZ, um, which I'm not trying to disparage DJ, but, you know, KZ is a starter for a reason. He's dynamic mm-hmm. um, in a different way than what DJ was. D- DJ, DJ could run, and he was a bigger body. So the way he impacted the game on runs was different, but just – you know, KZ's ability, he, he reminded me a lot of Mahomes in the mm-hmm. way that he could throw different arm angles and all of the different things that he was doing um, to to make it diff- difficult for defenses to scheme him and stop him. Um, so you guys are, you know, you guys are, are finished with the game. You go through the game. You're done for the season. Um, and then, you know, for you, for your career, what was uh, what was next steps for you? Did you go through? Um, obviously, you did the combine. I think, as I recall, uh, mm-hmm. so you did the or not the not the combine the pro day pro day pro day. Pro day. Yeah, yeah, you did the pro day. We talked with Trey uh, a couple of weeks ago about his pro day experience. What was your experience like, and were you getting any you know material interest uh, where you you were thinking about making the NFL like your long term career? Yeah, uh, well, this is off top, but one thing I also think Kate, they, people don't give Casey enough credit and Trey can attest is how smart he was. Probably one of the smartest football players yes. I've been around. Um, and now that I'm with, I'm, I've coached, you know, alongside Frost, and now I'm here with Coach Levy, and I've heard story. I mean, from what I've heard, Casey is one of the smartest, and obviously now he's in the coaching world, and hopefully yep. one day I can coach with him. Um, but from what I've heard, he is one, and I, and you know, fans might not know it, but he's one of the smartest quarterbacks that probably has been through UCF. You know, I, and yeah. obviously, like you said, his athletic ability to make all those throws and stuff like that, you know, is to speak for itself. But, you know, I think when you have, you know, that doesn't get enough credit with how smart of a football player he was. Yeah, amazing player. And we were all waiting for him to get his 
coaching mm-hmm. gig, this coaching gig. And, you know, I think all of us want uh, him to come back to UCF someday too. Like I, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm excited now. We had a few of the coaching staff that came back, like, um, you know, in the past, Becton was one, uh, Coach Fish, you know, there, there's a few mm-hmm. former players that have come back. Yep. But now that everybody's kind of getting out there, um, getting getting UCL, UCF alum back uh, on campus as coaches here, I'm excited about that, especially now that mm-hmm. we're a power four. I'm not going to say power five because that doesn't exist anymore. Power yeah. four conference, <laughs> uh, which is, you know, it, it's it's pretty amazing to think about. I mean, you think about where we were when you guys uh, were mm-hmm. playing. That made a lot of that happen. Um, you know, 2016 came along. They looked at us and said, ah, we're good. Um, but then you guys came back in 2017 and 2018 and, and truly showed out and allowed us to build a brand around it. And mm-hmm. um, I think that made a huge difference. And, and hats off to all of you guys for doing that because it was your sweat equity. It was your effort. It was your winning um, that really allowed us to to move on to that next level. And it was a joy to watch. I mean, having <laughs> podcasted well before then, I was part of the first uh, UCF podcast, as was Ben, doing a radio show during that time when you guys were um, you know, on fire locally. I can tell you, as someone who also was at UCF, as you can tell by my gray hair and receding hairline, uh, in 99, uh, and knowing where we were then, right, uh, to where we were when you guys were playing, um, you, you made a huge difference and, and you should be proud uh, of everything that you guys did. So, all right. Um, you know, you talked a little bit uh, about, um, you know, what you're doing today, but we really didn't go into that. So why yeah. don't you share with everybody, like the, the good news about all those things that you're doing? Yeah. Uh, so I did do pro day um, after the season. I had to get, you know, a big, an- you know, not a huge ankle, surgery, but I had to get an ankle surgery um, was playing on it all season, um, had, you know, pretty much no arthritis, you know, I, I didn't have a lot of it in my ankle, so I had to go in, they just scope it out and remove some things, um, did that. And then, you know, somehow it was supposed to be like a six month recovery, four month recovery, did it in like two, so I could do pro day, um, had a couple, you know, NFL teams that I did like a tryout for and stuff, but I always knew in my heart, I wanted to coach, um, you know, I knew that's what I wanted to do. I was a student of the game. I was able to learn under three head coaches, I think like four defensive coordinators. Um, so I got to, you know, learn a lot. Um, so I always knew I wanted to coach. Um, so right when I got done playing, I knew that was kind of my plan. And, um, you know, I rehabbed my ankle, did pro day, and then nothing kind of worked out. So I uh, went and coached at a high school for a year in Georgia where my brother was. Um, so I got to coach alongside with him. I was the D line there and he was linebacker. So it was pretty cool. Um, get to coach my older brother, which, you know, obviously when you're in college and he's in college, you don't see each other a lot. So it was cool experience in that. And then went to a division three school where I was, uh, Greensboro college, where I was, uh, the D line coach, the equipment manager, like academic advisor, I was like four different things, um, because they were just one different experience. Yeah. You know, they just wanted to give me a shot, you know, and at that point I was taking anything I can. So I went to division three and then. Uh, got a call, Coach DeWitt, actually, he was a special teams coordinator um, with Coach Frost, and he knew the O-line coach at Troy. So I went down to Troy, where I was the O-line GA for, I think, like four and a half months. And then Coach Frost um, and Coach Dawson called me up at Nebraska, I think it was 21, um, and called me, and they just had a special teams uh, GA uh, leave. And they're like, will you come do special teams? And I was like, yeah, I'll come up to Nebraska. The, you know, pay was a lot better and obviously a bigger conference. So I go up there and do special teams as a GA, then get promoted to a QC the next year. And then uh, obviously that next year, Coach Frost gets fired after, you know, game three. And then Coach Chen gets fired at game four. And I get promoted to coordinator, you know, 27-year-old coordinator in the Big Ten. You yeah. Know, kind of, uh, you know, for a guy who's only done special teams for two years, who was a former defensive lineman. <laughs> um, so I, you know, do that. And then, uh, last year I was at New Mexico state. Um, uh, there was at New Mexico state for, I think almost a year. I think today would have been a year. Uh, so I was at New Mexico state there where I did special teams again and ran everything. And, you know, uh, and then we had a coach Odom who actually was a special teams analyst at UCF my senior year. 
yep. got a call from Coach Levy to go be the special teams coordinator at Mississippi State, and he called me right after that and said, you're coming with me to be the analyst. Um, so now I'm, at Mississippi State, now I'm at Mississippi State with Coach Lev, Coach Odom, Coach Tuck, Coach Cooper, um, a bunch of guys. Oh, he brought all those? Really? Yeah. I don't know he brought yeah, all those. So. You, you just killed my special facts. Ah! Yeah, yeah, so now I'm here at Mississippi State as a special teams analyst, uh, you know, with a whole – whole bunch of guys who are at UCF, you know, uh, Mark, who was, I think he was in recruiting at UCF and, you know, so there's a whole bunch of people who I'm familiar with here. So, um, it's for sure, it's for sure nice. And I'm excited and, you know, going New Mexico is far, far from Atlanta now at, you know, in Mississippi where it's a little bit closer to Atlanta. How big of a difference did you see like when you jumped up to like Nebraska or some of these other schools as to where UCF was when you left like obviously ucf today is not ucf of when you were here right there's been a lot of change mm -hmm. like the the coaching staff they just added another random coach uh <laughs> a couple weeks ago right so but from a facility standpoint from a um you know from a fan standpoint what was what was the experience like compared to what what you experienced at ucf tell, tell them about nebraska joe yeah, I mean no. Nebraska's di Nebraska's different, uh, and you know they they do have really like the fans there are different. I mean, for to sell out what they've done, and you know it'll be like eleven o'clock kick, and it's five o'clock. I'm driving to the hotel, you know, at five thirty six, and they're already out there tailgating. Um, so those fans are there. They, it was a little different in that stadium, just going into that stadium, and all the Big Ten stadiums, obviously, yeah. it's a little different yeah. than going into you know some stadiums that we played at. Um, but you know when it comes to like athlete wise and stuff like that, in my opinion, I thought just the biggest change that I, was, I saw, you know, from my teams at like UCF and stuff to teams at Nebraska is like the O-line and D-line um, athlete wise. I thought we could match up with, you know, our athletes at UCF. Like we were a very, very athletic team. Um, but the biggest thing you see is like, we didn't have across the board, six, 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 five, 300 pound off monsters. Line. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's where I felt the biggest difference in the play was. And then obviously facilities. Um, I haven't been in the new facilities at UCF, so I, I couldn't attest now how it is. Um, but the facilities we went through, I mean, facilities nowadays, it's it's nuts. I mean, just what people have. I mean, even here at Mississippi State and what we had in Nebraska. I mean, Nebraska, right before I left, um, they were opening like a $180 million new facility, something crazy. I wish I could have saw it. Um, but <laughs> – the facilities that we went through, I think, like, I think Coach O'Leary said, we're having a game room and put like a couple. Uh, I don't know what the, I don't remember what those things were. Trey might know what they were. Y'all uh, remember like the the old school Pac Man, huge, yeah. like the size of a bed. Yeah, yeah, That's what yeah. he called a game room in twenty fifteen. Put four of those. Yeah, playstations and things like that. He put like the little with analog sticks like that, yeah. joysticks. Like we're making oh, a game room for you. Out. It's different now. They've got they've got like sleep uh, sleep room. They've oh, got yeah. uh, all kinds yeah, of Joe, stuff. If you yeah. go see that facility now, it's like you remember the sleep room at Nebraska, the little the all mm -hmm. blacked out room. Yeah. They have that now at UCF. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, they, I told them. I said yeah, if, we, if if we would have had those facilities like the Nebraska facilities, oh, it would have been a juggernaut at UCF. It's and Trey, I say yeah. I'm like those. Trey, I don't want to hear it, man. I, I went to I went to I started at UCF in 2002. The Wayne Dench had the the old Wayne Dench had the rusty weights. It was an old office building. Yeah, we don't we don't know about that. Y'all are that was our study. That was, that was our study hall room. My freshman year. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Hall. Yep. But yeah, I mean, so, I tell I, so I told this plenty of times, like. Uh, the, Ben just pulled the old man yeah. walking both ways to school. Good, man, I tell you what, I felt like I was walk, walking uphill both ways to school in the snow in Florida. I tell you what. <laughs> yeah, but like, ahead, Jay, Jay, like be, be, you can say it like Joe, like the difference in the mentality, like of the guys at UCF when we were there. How again, we didn't have a lot compared to yeah. you know all these other schools. We we were eating at Nitros, pizza, you know, like things like that. We have. Our, our little weight room, and and that was it. Pro, little chocolate milks after. You go to Nebraska, and you see, like, because I, I played with some of those guys, and you see some of them. The mentality is different, you know, and I that was one of the things I always said is, like, y'all, you guys don't. Y'all aren't hungry for really to be great. Like, y'all think y'all want to, but y'all really don't. And I, I th I've always said that's what I thought was special about our group, you know, was just 
we wanted to be great and we didn't have a lot. We made the most out of everything we could. Even, you know, when they were coach Duval and all of them were there, we made the most out of it. Yeah. Um, people would, and people you would go home for, people would go home for summer showing off all their gear. We'd go home with one shirt and it was our summer workout one shirt. <laughs> the same, bro, I had the same summer workout shirt and shorts for three years. <laughs> I'm telling you like that was, that was, but you know, we were proud of that. Like that was, that's what, you know, made us, at least that was our drive was to get to that point one day. You know, that was, at least for me, that's what we always wanted to do. And we always had each other, you know, it wasn't anything to where we didn't need all that either. That was just, you know, we had each other. So I, and I've always said like, to me, that's why it was always going to be hard for Frost because he walked into a situation of guys who were hungry, you know, like at UCF versus Nebraska. They weren't, they weren't hungry. I always tell the story. We were 0 6 and we're still selling out. Joe, when we were 0 6 at UCF, it might have been Roger in the stands. You know, it might have been Allen in the stands. Our family, uh, maybe, you know, and, and that was maybe it. Five students. And that was it, you know, just students because they didn't know what to do. They were just bored and didn't know what to do. That's what they were doing. So, you know, it, like that's not the same. And I've always said, like, you know, the confidence thing, it does change. And I think culture matters like i think that stuff matters in college football because when you have a culture where you're getting rewarded for losing every game why change you know what's the difference we hated when you know we're playing on tv and there's nobody in the stands nobody's cheering we're getting blown out every week it's embarrassing yeah so you know i speak to that at least like what you saw when you went to nebraska you know there's just those last final years of frost because i don't i know the first year and it was on the right trajectory what happened like what was what was the, the downfall no, I think what you said is 100% right. I think mentality, you know, that's how I, like you said, is I thought, you know, I think that's what kind of went wrong is mentality. And then obviously Coach Frost was being back in his home state. He had all, he had high expectations. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah. very, very high, you know, but, you know, I, he gave me an opportunity to go up there. So I care for that man a lot and a lot. won us a lot of games at UCF. So, um, you know, I care for that guy a lot. Um, but I just think, like Trey said, it's just like, the mentality that we had at UCF, it's different than what they had at Nebraska when they walked into there, you know, yep. so much, you know, so different. It's like, you know, we did the, uh, the circuit, you know, coach Duvall came into the circuit and it was nothing for us. And they're like, that this wasn't bad. And I was like, again, like going back, we went through bad. We know what bad is. And then like, the guy, yeah. you hear stories up at Nebraska, they did the circuit up there and they had like, you know, three or four kids pass out, you know, yeah, like- so it's just like mentality and stuff. And I, and I think that's a hundred percent, you know, and I tell people all the time, you know, it's the mentality. Yep. And, and that's what, I mean, I get on here all the time and show Roger pretty much every week when we would talk. That's what I was always most upset when, you know, just you, I know you might not follow you as much, but like we follow it. But like every week it's like, where did that mentality go that we had, mm-hmm. you know, that we left to the Gabe Davis, to Otis, to Marlon, because they kept it because that's all yeah, they knew. For sure. You know, where, where did it get lost? And, you know, to me, I, I say it's that point of NIL where, you know, it's kind of free agency now. You know, guys are pay for play. You know, that's that that wasn't us. That was never us. Now, did we want? Of course we wanted it. But that was <laughs> never, you know, that was never us. So, uh, you know, I, I think that's the difference. Um, and, and it sucks because, again, we poured our blood, sweat, and tears on those Friday mornings, red shirt. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you have guys that are complaining about the fans. I'm like, y'all are complaining about. 95 percent sellouts like don't complain about that go look you don't know when there was nobody here you know like that's that's always that's what frustrates me at least just you know now that i'm just a fan i'm a normal person Mm -hmm. you know just watching the games uh it's just that mentality that i feel like we've kind of lost it in college sports at least here you know i think we've lost it a little bit i think there are guys but overall i think you're just kind of losing it so all right, Alan, I think you had a, a question or a comment that you wanted to make. Yeah, Joey, uh, speaking of that, like NIL, obviously when college football has undergone a huge transition in the last few years, when you first started coaching nil and the transfer portal, like we know it today, didn't really exist. And now uh, as a coach at Mississippi State and, you know, where you've been in your journey, you're starting to see it a lot more. How much has that impacted your like role as a coach, like starting when it, you know, when you first started coaching, it really wasn't there. Now it is you have to deal with things like the nil and and, um, you know, like the portal and having a lot of roster turnover year to year. And it's like free agency, like uh, Trey said. So how much has that impacted your role as a coach? Uh, Very, very big. When it comes to the portal, I think it goes back to um, you got to have a relationship with all these kids. It doesn't matter, 
you know, who, you know, where they come from or, you know, if you recruited them or if you didn't recruit them, you better have a relationship with all these kids. Um, and I'm, you know, that's the big thing I made sure of when I, you know, was coordinator at Nebraska when I went to Mexico State is first thing I do is I like, you know, and I learned it from Hypo, I learned it from Coach Dawson with under Frost staff is I, the first thing I have is I have these players over my house. I, you know, I let them come meet my wife. I let them come meet my dog. I let them, I let make sure I cook for them because um, people don't realize all these players don't get a home cooked meal, you know. Mm -hmm. So first thing I think with the portal is you have to make sure like you have a general relationship with every single one of the players. And there might be a player who was the portal that you thought you had a good relationship with it, but might be a better situation or it's like we're at New Mexico state and we have a, you know, a kid who we know is way better in New Mexico state and he could go get paid a lot more. It's just the way it is um, that nowadays with college football. Um, but I think the way you keep players in your program is you treat them right and you have a really good relationship with them. Um, and then, yeah, and I also definitely changed the game. I mean, obviously every situation is different when you're recruiting, you know, you might have a kid who, you know, might care about the money a little bit, you know, might want, you know, a certain amount, or you might want, you might not even talk to the kid. You might talk to somebody else and they want, you know, a lot of money. And, you know, so you just don't know. It, it changes to very, very with every different recruit. So it's definitely changed the game. I joke around with people all the time. Like nowadays with D tackles, if I went into the portal my senior year, I probably would have got paid. Who are you um, telling? Oh my gosh! <laughs> I mess around with people all the time because when you look out there, people are always looking for like D tackles and you know always looking for that pass rush end and O linemen and but D tackles and O line I mean big ones. So I took I joke around with people all the time. I was like, man, if I was you know, and a lot of the coaches joke around about it. So <laughs> it's changed the game a lot, you know. And and some people, you know, it's for it's for you know for a better situation. They might leave, and you know, we don't know what you know their home life is like, or you know, maybe they don't like it here and they have a chance to go, you know, do something better. So it's like every situation is just different that you walk into. But I'll tell you what, it's changed the game of college football a lot. Yeah, middle linebackers too. They're they're mm -hmm. uh, they've got a premium uh, for them as well now. So you know, Joey, you covered so much with us, and I really appreciate your time. And you know, one of the things that I always enjoyed a home cooked meal, and I know you did too, because I saw you there. Uh, was after games in 2017 where the parents had the uh, the grill out after the games. Uh, we would all head over there and uh, we would eat with the parents, the mom squad. We knew everybody, you know, we knew Shaquem and Shaquille's parents and all mm -hmm. that stuff. So they always invited us over. So that was always fun. I, I, I feel like that identity, uh, I, I think, is a huge, huge thing that's kind of changed. Uh, that That togetherness, I think, with NIL specifically, um, you know, with it being a cash deal, essentially, and and not having to be in one place uh, for a period of time, because you can really change every year to year, right? Mm -hmm. I think that does have a, an impact on that. Um, what do you see, uh, and I don't know how much you've paid attention, but UCF's last year's team, what did you see that was going well and uh, kind of went sideways and, and um you know, I, I think we all have expectations for next year's team with KJ Jefferson and everything. What do you foresee for the future for UCF? Yeah, I mean, I was able to catch. I don't think I was able to like really sit down and watch one full game. I might have been able to watch one, um, but I for sure I, I always keep up with it. You know, put a lot of time there, so I always keep up with UCF. I always have the alerts on, so I know what's going on after my game. Um, but I think just last year, the big thing, I think injury hurt, obviously, with uh, John Rice going out. I think that took a big blow, and you could see it kind of took it out of the team. But, I mean, when you look at athlete-wise and matchup-wise and you look at UCF's athletes compared to, you know, Oklahoma and the rest of the guys, you know, the teams that Texas and all those guys that played, I mean, I thought UCF had just as good athletes. And, my, and that's just my opinion from looking at them. Um, you know, injury hurt. And then also you, you're running a brand new defense. Your DC leaves and goes to Arkansas. So you're running a new defense in a new league. So I think that, you know, hurt a little bit. And But I think just the injuries, you could tell, played a role, um, in my opinion, to last year. Obviously, I you know, wasn't able to watch a ton um, with what I'm doing. And then, you know, obviously, I think just, you know, expectations are always high. Obviously, go to a bowl game is always a big expectation. Like, you know, there's, you know, and people, you know, I get it, UCF had a down year, but when you look at teams who entered the Big 12, like, you know, who's the one that went to a bowl game? Right. I think people forget about that. Um, you know, you look at what happened to Houston, you look at Missouri, you look at BYU. Um, you know, so I think people forget about that. 
Uh, but I, you know, I always expect them going to a bowl game and then obviously more than that. <clears throat> and obviously in the future, I can see them going to the playoffs and winning big 12 championship. I think that's the expectation that me and Trey <laughs> built there. And that's kind of what we expect now. Yeah. I think, I think that last year's team, I think, uh, what the, what the expectations were. I think the expectations were low going into the season. Um, but then once we, you know, we looked good. Uh, and I think as we kind of, you know, showed that we could compete, I think uh, it was missed opportunities is, is what everybody was feeling after the fact. I mean, Baylor game is a perfect example of that. That was nuts. Like I watched that game. I'm like, really? Are we going to let Baylor beat us now? Like after all this, but um yeah, I think it's, uh, but I, but I think that UCF fans now, you know, when you guys were playing, we're like, we could line up with anybody, um, and we could win against anybody, and we could. The question is, could we do it consistently because of depth? And I think last year, what you were seeing is us starting to transition and and change and upgrade our positions uh, to be able to do that in a power conference uh, over a period of time, and and quite frankly. We were expecting to go to like an air raid style conference. We ended up in a smash mouth football like yeah. uh, conference, which was our personnel just it was built for our defensive personnel was built around an air raid style and stopping an air raid style. And that's not what happened. So it was uh, it was an interesting year. But um, all right. I'm just going to ask you one quick question. You've been so amazing with your time and we really appreciate it. But we always ask this question. Give me your favorite uh, story and and most humorous situation while you were a player at UCF. Oh, geez, favorite story. I mean, favorite story for me is probably you know I, I know it's, it's probably winning the Peach Bowl. I mean, it's it's not even close. Um, that's probably you know my favorite story. And then I mean everything that just happened that game, and then beating Auburn, which was even better, uh, is doing that because. Uh, my brother's wife graduated from Auburn. I had a bunch of people there being from Atlanta. So being in my hometown and then um, probably the the night after that, because uh, Coach Frost, if you're like from there, you're allowed to stay there. So the night after in Atlanta was a great time. I uh, got to celebrate that. Um, that's probably my favorite memory going back, uh, winning a big game like that. But honestly, all the memories, you know, I wouldn't be where I am today without, uh, you know, going to UCF and, meeting all the guys like Trey and, you know, all the guys that I still talk to to this day. So that's probably my favorite memory, though. And then, you know, probably the funniest story is probably Coach O'Leary uh, threatening us with peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. For oh, food. my God. That's oh, my Trey part. didn't tell bro, this story. Bro, bro, that's, bro, probably bro. My fa- that's probably we the funniest talk, story I've talk ever about heard. That, I talk about that to, like, Chavis and said and all them. We talk about that at least once a month. Like, that was insane. Mm-hmm. So what was so, the story? You can't just like set it up that way and not tell us what happened. What had uh, happened was, oh, uh, pretty much. I mean, obviously, a lot of things weren't going right that year. Uh, losing a lot of games, and then uh, you know we got you know we'd always like Friday night meals at UCF. Like you look forward to those. Like, we eating you're, good. You're getting lasagna. You're getting you're getting steak. You're getting you're, whatever. Like you think of like. Well, you like we're getting the best food. You're getting an ice cream bar at the end, and then pretty much we weren't performing like we were performing. And pretty much if we keep going down that track, pregame meal is going to be peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Yep. <laughs> I'll never forget because you remember, you know, how with Coach O'Leary, we would sit in silence, like in the you couldn't really talk a lot. We were just sitting, and Cal Bloom got up to get an extra plate, and O'Leary said, You think you deserve an extra plate? You deserve a peanut butter and jelly sandwich next. And that's when he went on a rant, and we're like, so uh, who's going to go up and get this uh, cheesecake next? <laughs> Nobody moved. We just all no, were like, we're going back to our room. We're done. If a fork like, hits a plate, people freak out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that was, I, but I'm telling you, those were like, that was that was the fun. Like, I always say that 0-12 year was horrible. But like, that was some of the funniest, like, funniest moments by far was that year. Like, just yeah. what happened throughout the year. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing that. And uh, Joey, if uh, people want to get up with you or or at least follow your career, how can they find you on Twitter or any of the other socials? Uh, yeah, I think I think Coach Coach underscore Connors one is my Twitter. Yeah, because you um, changed it. Because I followed your I old Twitter. 
Uh, I've, like I probably yeah. I think I changed it once I got into uh, coaching, and then obviously after the hit, I needed to change it. Uh, yeah. Got a lot of, a lot you of. Got a lot of threats. hate. Did you get some uh, hate? Yeah. Got a lot of hate. <laughs> um, so that's probably the best way to fought. Um, you know, I'm not the biggest guy on social media, but you know, I'll probably I need to be more active. So that's probably the best way. Um, I've, I've moved, I think, already like six times in seven years or something crazy like that. Um, so. <laughs> But yeah, yeah that's the best way to follow it, me. If anybody's looking, it's coach underscore Connors, C O N N O R S one. So yep. clearly there was another coach Connors out there. Uh, but he's <laughs> our only, uh, one and only coach Connors from UCF football. So again, Joey, thank you so much for uh, jumping on. I remember seeing you when you were in school, dude, as a freshman. Mm -hmm. You probably don't remember me, but I remember you. <laughs> uh, Trey, uh, Trey and I have kept a friendship up ever since those days. And, um, you know, just really appreciate everything that you did for UCF football and that team did for UCF football. Um, and, and for us in general, cause it was a heck of a, a heck of a ride. I'd like to say something else, but we're a clean <laughs> show. Um, and you know, as you, uh, I'm going to continue to follow along your coaching career, and I followed along uh, this entire time. We'd love to talk to you again sometime if you have the time. I know coaching that your schedule is nuts. I wouldn't want it. I mean, the closest thing is like I'm. I own three businesses, so I'm. I might be close, but not nearly as close as the hours that you guys put in. People don't realize the hours, the time, the effort, how much time you spend uh, at the facilities and in your family um also supporting you and doing that so um love that you're doing great can't wait to keep watching you grow and uh charge on my friend appreciate it guys hopefully i'll uh, peace jose hopefully i'll be coaching in the bounce house one day is the goal oh yeah you, uh, you love it. Be great man if you get back i need sideline passes i mean i can press <laughs> hey hey you can't jump me you can't jump me hold on now. you can't he, jump me he has like hundreds of other people that are before you <laughs> i just called Dibs, and you, we all know when you call dibs or you call shotgun, the first one who says it gets it. So that's where I'm go. gonna leave. But uh, appreciate, thank you, Joey. appreciate it. All right, Thanks, all right man, Joey, stay See safe out there, man. All right, man. Have a good one. All right, good so guy, man. that's a good guy. That's great. He's more that's than a, a good, good guy, guy. Uh, and he was a good guy in college too. Like he, oh know, yeah, uh, he. Uh, you know, when I knew him back then, I don't know if he remembers me from then or not, but, um, you know, I had a different hairstyle and it was a lot less gray, but, um, you know, I, he, he just was a, a, a really, really good guy, approachable, great teammate. Uh, nobody ever said anything bad about Joey Connors and he's carrying that forward and, and seeing success in his coaching career. That's, that's the guy you want to root for. Um, uh, I think his beard game was a little bit better back then. Uh, but you know, <laughs> Well, gonna, that's when you can let it. You could be let it go scruffy. You didn't really care how you look. There was a look to be a D lineman. All those guys just you just let well, it go. I'll say this: let it I go. Mean, standard operating look. There yeah. you go. Yeah, man. Well, Coach uh, Coach O'Leary didn't allow the facial hair, so he took full advantage when, uh, uh, when everybody uh, did. The second Coach Frost, I remember Coach Chins was like, "I don't care what kind of hair you have. I don't care what kind of beard you have." Man, I think people didn't shave for months like it was <laughs> you didn't see a clipper razor nothing oh. ever again so they took advantage of that well that was but a yeah, great man. interview we've yeah. got a we've uh we've got a lot of other football stuff to talk about too um uh we're gonna have to unfortunately cut it shorter probably because we're already an hour and 23 in because he gave <laughs> such a great interview yeah. Um, and Josh, of course, regaled us with his opera stories and everything else uh, <laughs> going on. So I had a good, I had a solid 10 minutes of fame and then just got chopped off like a chop block. <laughs> well, you know, well, you know, I, I hate to say this, okay. but Joey Connors is a little bit more important. So, um, we're, we're thankful that he, that he came on <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and saved us from that, from that storyline. All right. So. <laughs> I don't know, guys. What do you guys want to do? I'm going to leave it up to you. Do you guys want to keep talking football for a little bit, and then, or do you want to go ahead and transition to basketball? Let's go to basketball. Yeah, let's go to basketball. <laughs> All right, let's hit it. Basketball. Football. It oh. See those. Basketball are, you see those are the good guys. Those were the guys that I got to play with. It was so much fun playing with them, man. It was. It was a blast. Cause all that was that was all of my class, all from the top to the bottom. 
that's how all of those guys were, man. It was that uh that story of him racing that running back was an awesome story. That was a great story. <laughs> I, I forgot I was thinking about asking what his 40 time was at his pro day, and I forgot to ask him what his actual 40 time was. He can move though. Joey was explosive. I mean, I think he was probably one of the higher cleaning D linemen. And that like there's a lot of different weights that you kind of measure explosiveness. Power clean is one of them, and he was always at the top. But and again, you line up Joey with most of those guys, he's beating all of them in a the race. So yeah, it, he I, was I, an explosive dude. I hate power clean, so we're not going to talk <laughs> about that. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and transition to hoops. Uh, as uh, Nopra, the producer, so beautifully put uh, in in this segment, the not so beautiful BYU game. Um, let's, uh, but before we get started in that, let's do a little text talk. So UCF, the UCF hoops text talk, who wants to start us off? I, I, I got it real quick. I mean, I, it's all I have for the text talk. And so we were actually recording while that game was going on. So it was like, you know, one eye here, one eye there, ESPN in the background with Roger soliloquies. And we had this great, uh, I, I, we were, we were kind of seeing what happens in most basketball games this you know latter half of the year we saw some of it in the beginning we have this first uh half and it's it just gets away from us like it, it just does and it's you know five eight ten fifteen and this this kind of flexible uh getting behind score mostly right uh <laughs> god this is why you have to watch on youtube i'm not cross-eyed thank you uh <laughs> oh geez man all right so um so at that point at the half i'm like we're we're either going to keep fighting or we're losing by 20 there's no in between that was at halftime of the game and at the beginning of half at the second half i thought we were on the losing by 20 plus part but just like the home game maybe we'll get back to it a little bit we actually kept fighting and fighting but just like that home game just couldn't get to over the top like couldn't couldn't get one point ahead and that seems to be a going theme um on most road games and unfortunately also now a few home games so yeah ah <laughs> uh, yeah so that was my text talk. yes thank you oh my god i'm getting i'm getting like trashed everywhere here dear listeners. i have on the video that i actually go first because well i just jumped ahead i have on a side chat alan dragging me <laughs> this, is, this is come on people come on Let's see what happens when I have when I uh, when I uh, don't have to produce and Nobra's on there. I can come up with those funny quips as we kind of move along. So, uh, Trey Neal, what did you have for your text talk this week? Yeah, mine was again. I'm I'm kind of I'm in the boat of squashing the narrative that Josh is the reason we're losing games. So he said, "Doing my part this week, not going to the game. Would love to sell the tickets for extra karma." You know, I'm thinking, okay, you know, if, if Josh isn't going, we're gonna win. But recently, I'm starting to see a trend. Josh doesn't go to these games. We're starting to lose close games. So I think we need to change the trend up again. You know, early in the year, we got to get what you away because you, you were it, Was it only one game, though, that that, uh, that no. trend? I, oh, no, okay, no. Well, so, so one thing, I didn't sell the Cincinnati tickets. That was the problem. I, I put them up and no one bought Because <laughs> you didn't sell them to a Cincinnati fan. That sell. was a big thing. So I sold my Oklahoma State uh, – uh, not Oklahoma State, Oklahoma tickets because I couldn't be there. I sold my Kansas mm -hmm. tickets. Uh, well, actually, no, it's the other way around. I sold both of those. So, yeah, yeah, and we won, right? So I sold Kansas and we won just because I wanted to make most of my money for the season back. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of wish I would have had the 600 bucks. I would have <laughs> given the 600 bucks to be there. Oklahoma, I, I wasn't in the state. I couldn't even go. And we won that game. So, yeah, we uh, so we have two ranked teams coming up. So, so it's about selling the tickets now. It's not really about you being there. It's about selling the tickets. So Josh not only Josh is not so what we just heard is Josh is not doing this uh for fun. Uh he needs to sell the tickets. So now he's trying to leverage to the show the into making sure he's we, listen. If I happen to sell a ticket for enough, I'll get the stupid duck off of our YouTube channel. How about that? There you go. All right. Uh Josh is gonna go duck hunting. All right. Um too tall Ben. 
Uh, what is your text talk for this week? So first off, there's no such thing as too tall. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, I I guess I just wanted to make sure we said I said this out loud on the on the pod. Uh, but so it, at the time, there was a couple minutes left in the BYU game, and we were talking about how the stats weren't really showing totally showing the story, except for obviously the re, the um, at the time it was the it was the free throws. Then we'll and we'll get into that. But I said I'll rebound it by ten and three for sixteen from three is probably the biggest difference in the stat sheet. Um, obviously the stats wound up being a little bit different than that. Um, cause there was a couple of minutes left in the game here, but this is what, this is what I wanted to say on the pod, uh, the toughness and zero quit in this team that this team has is just so easy to root for. They're my favorite team since BJ taco and Chad Brown. I mean, I just think that this, while this last two games has just been tough to lose two close games, I mean, literally by two points each. Um, has been tough to see, you know, they, they, they battled back, but it just wasn't enough to overcome some, some rough starts. Um, but, uh, but the fact that they do battle back, the fact that they don't quit no matter what, I mean, I think we were down by what 16 in the second half against, um, against Cincinnati, which we'll get into, but like, uh, just the fact that they have no quit and they, they just continue to battle to the last whistle is, um, is, is the reason why I just, I just enjoy rooting for this this UCF basketball team, and I think the fan base has really taken to them as well, regardless of the overall results in the last uh, you know couple weeks. Um, it's uh, it's just it's just they're an easy team to root for, that's for sure. All right, so uh, Alan, I guess yeah. you're last but not least, but certainly not. <laughs> but I don't know. It doesn't work for you. It only works for Josh. Yeah. All right. Go ahead, Alan. What do you no, got? I originally had a Trey's uh, text talk, but another one I liked was uh, Ben made a, a comment about the refs that we can't really repeat on here. But uh, <laughs> I'm not, oh, oh my goodness. But, Both uh, of these games, Cincinnati too. Let's not, uh, we'll, we'll yeah, talk and about that too. I'm usually one that's not for blaming the refs, and I'm not blaming the refs for the total loss, but it was something that was just so noticeable. I think, Roger, you made the comment that. BYU had a school record tied a school record for uh, free throws made in a game. I mean, especially with UCF's defense, you don't normally see that many free throws allowed or uh, attempts at least. And it was just very noticeable. So I think that comment uh, by Ben was really relevant for this, for that game specifically. Yeah. I, I mean, honestly, some, some of the way that that was ref but we've said it before right I, I know we've got an aggressive defense right but there's been several games this season where the imbalance in the in the free throw column has just been stark and it's not just us it's not just UCF fans like I know like you know everybody's like oh you can't blame it on the refs or whatever but all the other teams are having issues you got you got guys being thrown out of games uh two coaches uh this season got thrown out of games and AD got fined. Yeah. yeah. AD got fined. I mean, top teams in the conference. <laughs> yeah. And, and I mean, it's it's a narrative. It's not just UCF fan, fans saying ho hum, blah, 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 whatever. The coaches and the ADs themselves are coming out and saying this is atrocious. And then we heard that they didn't get graded at the end of the year or, or the Big 12 didn't track their performance. Like, are you serious? The wow. Big 12? You don't track the performance? <laughs> I mean, obviously, <laughs> yeah, clearly, because <laughs> if not, they'd have been getting a failing grade. But that being said, um, let's let's actually talk a little bit more detail. Obviously, uh, UCF loses to number 19 uh, BYU 90 to 88. Oh, so close. Um, you know, UCF, like we said, was down through a, a lot of this game. And, and they have this, you know, they, they it was weird because we mentioned on the podcast a few times how UCF had kind of turned the corner on a couple of things. One, bless you, Alan. Bless you. Uh, the, uh, the first one was, um, you know, that UCF had started scoring earlier, whereas before earlier in the year, they hadn't really done anything in the first half. And then they, you know, put it together in the second half, but they had strung together several games where that was different. We were coming out firing, um, you know, Houston was one, like there was, there was a few others where we just came out firing. 
And then secondly, the consistency, right? We've been talking about consistency, whether it be uh, balance or consistency and rebounding. Uh, we're talking about consistency in, uh, in the offense where you're not going three or four minutes with you know, offense, and uh, that's found us again. So. Your, uh, your mic's a little bit messed up there, Roger. Something happened again with your audio. Under oh. the sea. <laughs> Under the sea. Under the sea. Uh, oh boy, are we? Is that better now, or, or, or am yeah, I still? Yeah, you're good now. You're good now. Uh, all right, yeah, yeah, Roger's yeah. having some technical difficulties, <laughs> and and we're si we're singing the Little Mermaid. So you guys are getting a show uh, <laughs> in, in within the show this week. Um, yeah. So a combo breaker. Yeah. Yeah, but 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 the whole the the whole point that I was trying to make is that consistency. Uh, in offense and not having those three or four minute, um, you know, times where, where just the offense falls. Then we make a run, we get it close, and then they just completely stutter again and, and don't look like they know what they're doing. Um, and, and that's tough. So, um, you know, Darius Johnson in this game, uh, he had 20 points. Sellers had 17 points. Machowski, um, this was kind of his coming out game, I think, uh, had 11 points. We've been talking about him quite a bit. And he seems like he's he's starting to figure it out. UCF was out rebounded 37 and 32 earlier in the season. We did a lot better on the glass. Um, UCF shot 50% from the floor, which was a pretty good shooting percentage. This was a good anytime you score 88 points in the Big 12, you've got a good offensive game going, right? Um, but Again, another bugaboo is consistency in those free throws. Sometimes we're shooting 70, 80%. This game we shot 53%, uh, which just gave us 14 points. So those are lost possessions. Those should be possessions that turn into points, but they're lost possessions, essentially. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, when we're talking about that, if you're shooting 50%, or 53%, that, could, that means you're leaving 14 points at the free throw line. Uh, which in a 90 to 88 game, even if you pick up a quarter of those, right? Even if you're shooting 70% or anything, um, you know, that's going to make a difference. Now it changes the flow of the game, right? Uh, but at the same time, you know, free throws matter. They're free points for a reason. And if you're putting the effort into to getting fouled, um, then you should do that. You should You should hit those. Uh, free throws. So but the, they put they made fourteen more free throws than we attempted as a team. They made exactly. fourteen more. Like that's insane. And it was still ninety to eighty eight. Yeah. Then we attempted, which is just nuts. Yeah. I mean, they they scored forty points from the free throw line, and we lost by two. It's just like what? Like if you would have told me that that BYU scores ninety points against us, like I would have figured we got blown out. Like right. I, I didn't think that we could hang with them offensively the way that we did. But we also spotted them 10 points, as you said, Roger. Like, we spotted them 10 points in the game. We were down 10 nothing, And then we came out in the second half and went from being down – I think we were down by what? We were down by 13 at the half, and then eventually we were down by 19 a few minutes into the second half. And so, like, we're, we allowed them to go on runs kind of – it was the beginning of the game – close out the second half or close out the first half, start the second half. And that was when we had to, we had to claw our way back into it. And it just wasn't enough at the end. We're like, we can't spot a top 20 team, top five, top three offensive team in their house. We can't spot them 10 points. Like, it's just like, you just can't do that. Like on the road, especially. And it's, and it's, um, it's amazing that this game even, came down to it you know came down to the wire the way it did because of that but i'm I go continue with the rest of the stats but it was just it was wild that that happened well i was gonna say the um the turnovers were low considering how many points were scored and how many possessions were there we only had nine turnovers to 17 for byu and that really made the difference uh for us in getting back in this game we had 19 fast break points right mm -hmm. um and a lot of that is 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 points off of the turnovers uh, that we were able to generate. And, and they did phenomenally. That. That's what got us back in that game. And we get in these spurts where we start getting steals and whatever. And, and BYU is a good passing team. That's what they're known for is their mm -hmm. fundamentals. Um, 
And, you know, we were able to disrupt that. So that was very positive for us. Um, um, 27 points off of turnovers. 27 points off of turnovers to nine points for BYU. So that's really where we made that up. We had 46 points in the competition, which is a place that we said we needed to focus on and get better at, uh, versus uh, BYU's 26. Um, and uh, foul, foul difference. Here, 27 fouls committed by UCF, which is nice. So uh, most of those fouls that were called on BYU were towards the end of the game when it's already kind of out of hand. So those are almost like makeup calls. But still, uh, you know, they were they had 46 attempts. We had 26 attempts uh, at the free throw line. So that was really the story of this game. Um, you know, I guys played hard uh they they you know they clearly can play with the number 19 team in the country just like they can play with the number 16 team in the country just like they can play with all of these other teams we just needed a couple of wins right now for the season and and now i think the tournament um you know is pretty much gone i mean byu or byu big 12 is uh wild but after this and the cincinnati game i think it'll be yeah, you're still kind of cutting out again, Roger, on the audio. But um, and I think after we kind of review the two games, I, I want to jump into some of those chances that we have um, of making the tournament. But uh, I, I I think that obviously these two games would have been huge, and they were both two you know two point losses. Uh, we can get into the details of the of the Cincinnati game as well. But this BYU game, it was just it was just a um, actually both of them really but they were like game of runs that just kind of we weren't able to really even out in the end i i, I mean you mentioned nils machowski i i agree he, he had his he had his best game in a ucf uniform um against byu on the road in a very tough environment asked to you know shoulder a decent amount of minutes in that game um but i thought especially offensively he was extremely poised he hit a humongous three um i think it was about two and a half minutes left um on an underneath out of bounds play kind of came off a screen and and i went to the weak side corner and uh shamari allen hit him with a perfect pass and he knocked it down i mean that was a huge shot um uh, so I was really pleased to see the way that he played in this game, 11 points, uh, two big steals. He had a couple of, uh, I think, his steal, you know, down the stretch. That was huge as well. Um, you know, that's going to be huge, um, having another guard that can step in there along with Anton Jones that, um, you know, kind of comes off the bench and provides some good quality minutes. Um, uh, but, but, yeah, overall it was just – it was just kind of like a – the stats don't totally tell the story. Um, you know, I think that we uh, kind of the way that this, some of my frustration with UCF basketball teams in the last five or six years is that when they do struggle um, offense, like the, when they do struggle, like with a, with a high powered offensive teams, they fall back into like uh one-on-one -on -one, you know, matchups or, or just kind of like that one-on-one -on -one street ball game or whatever that just never really works out for them. This team doesn't do that. They still stay together. They still make crisp passes. They try not to turn the ball over or whatever. And so um, it, you saw that in this BYU game. They just they just fell short at the end. All right. Uh, anybody have anything else that they want to talk about with regard to BYU? All right, so the not so beautiful, yeah, the not so beautiful Cougars uh, are are in now officially in the rearview mirror. Let's go ahead and talk about Cincinnati a little bit. Another close game, seventy six to seventy four. And from a stats perspective, UCF was pretty impressive, um, you know, in this game again. So um, <clears throat> we were we were outscored thirty seven thirty at the half. And um, we outscored the Bearcats 44 to 39 in the second half. So our defense uh, was being broken down a little bit in, in this game in the second half. 
Um, Johnson, again, led the way, 16 points. Allen and Sellers both had 15. Uh, UCF shot 47% from the field. Again, a good shooting percentage day. Uh, Cincinnati only shot 42%. So they actually shot worse than what we did. Um, but we got out rebounded 45 to 33, um, 18 to eight on the offensive glass. So it was those putbacks that really, uh, that really hurt us. And for some reason, UCF and Ben, you've said this multiple times, has a problem, uh, in the paint on those three to four foot type of bunnies, um, that, that kind of hurt us. Um, since he shot 61% from the free throw line and 26% uh, from three. So Cincinnati really wasn't a, um, a, a good team from that perspective either. So um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's really, really interesting when you look at this. We shot 47, 47.5% from the field goal percentage, 33% from three versus 29 we had 18 uh, free throw attempts versus their 21, so pretty close there. We shot 77.8% from the from the charity stripe this game. Um, it, it This game really was rebounds, uh, in my opinion. And Cincinnati made us pay uh, off of turnovers. They got 19 points off of turnovers versus our 14. Um, so that, that really, I mean, points in the paint, 36 to 36. Uh, that was even even, right? So... It, it was all about the offensive glass and being able to box out better and make sure uh, that we uh, that we can, you know, stop them from doing that. And I don't know what's going on, but that seems to have gotten worse. And we did lead in this game. We, we led by two at one point in this game. And then, of course, the refs at the end. So, Ben, this is this is I'd love your analysis on um on, on that that those last few sequences in the game there. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I'll, I'll leave it to somebody else actually, because I, I kind of like missed it live and I wasn't able to really watch it back. Unfortunately, I was well. Unfortunately, uh, I wasn't able to really see it in detail. I was listening to it on the radio. I was listening to Mark Daniels' call, <laughs> um, and so he was he was rather him and Taylor Young were rather animated. Um, and so uh, anyone who anyone else can kind of provide a little bit better an analysis than me. And um, I was on my way to a concert on Saturday night and I missed it live uh, uh, as far as uh, as far as watching it. But um, certainly there was some tough calls down the stretch that that killed us. And it's 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 unfortunate that we were in that position. I'll say I'll say that because um, I think some of the runs that happened that Cincinnati took on kind of about the um, let's call it a, a, a few minutes into the second half to about the 13 minute mark was, was where a, you know, a big Cincinnati run that kind of um, was that they were able to kind of uh, maintain towards the end when we, when we kind of kind of came charging back. So. All right, Josh, you were shaking your head a lot. Do you want to tackle it? No. Um, I, I was uh, in the exact same boat. <laughs> as, <laughs> as, as, uh, no one saw it. Fact, <laughs> it is my birthday weekend, dude. I, I was doing a lot of stuff that wasn't related to sports. Um, All right, so let me let me let me say it then. I guess okay. I'm trying to give you guys airtime, and clearly I can't do that. No, not, not on this one. All right, um, about, uh, Arias. So, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so at at the end of the game, um. We were we were down um, and we had the, the possession and we head faked basically uh, at the three point line behind the three point line. And when we head faked, got the guy to jump, jumped up and shot the three were fouled, but they didn't call a foul on it. Every other game that's been called on us. Right. Every single game. Everywhere else that's called. That's the biggest no-no in, in college basketball defensively is you don't foul a three-point shooter. Um, but got him to jump. He jumped, was fouled in the air. That should have been three free throws with one of with DJ, who is one of our best uh, free throw shooters um, that we have on the team. So the score is 76-74. We had a we had a shot at um at uh, I think I think 
for some reason I'm I'm remembering that uh, that it was a three. It should have been a three point play, so we would have had a chance to win on free throws, basically. And um, it was just a blown call, and I think everybody everybody was up in arms about that. I mean, people that don't normally complain about the refs were up in arms about that. So it was, um, you know, it was a terrible call. And if anything, we should have got a little home cooking because we were playing on our home court, you know, but we haven't been getting that all season, I don't think. Yeah, no, definitely not. And if you would have heard Mark, like Mark Daniels doesn't hold back on those types of moments when it comes to an obvious wrong call and and he was hot on the air um when that i when was that hot yeah i mean it was just it just seemed to be like just a wild sequence where there was just disbelief of um that they didn't call it in that way it's just it's un, it's extremely unfortunate but it's again i'll say it again i mean it's just it's unfortunate that we were in that position where we you know where we needed that call but the refs have been a, have been an issue throughout the Big 12, but, but in particular, and I know we're biased, but like, I mean, in particular, like we've seen it throughout the conference slate for UCF. I mean, it just seems like there's some odd calls going on. I mean, like even going back to, you know, we were, we were talking about this on text talk, but the, you know, going back to the end of, of, of the, um, the UCF BYU game where they, the the refs in a critical moment they like blew the whistle but they blew the whistle to to figure out if a shot was a three or a two and like they so they gave each team an, an extra like timeout but it was like it's just a strange time to like stop the game at that point when UCF is trying to charge back and so it's just a, that's just another example of the refs kind of influencing the outcome of the game yeah yeah that's that's where that's where it gets frustrating. If it doesn't matter, you know, if we were going to lose anyway and it's a, a no call three point, fine. But when you have the ability to influence the outcome of the game, the ref should not step into that mm -hmm. um, unless it's something blatant like that three point shot. I mean, you you get that call every day of the week, any in any league in the entire country. And, and we didn't get that call. It was it was just ridiculous. So. All right. Uh, so, you know, at 13 and 11 now, four and eight in the Big 12. Uh, remember, I said four wins uh, at the beginning of the season. Ben, That's I think you said five. No, I said four uh, as well. That was my, we were both in agreeing, you know, agreeance on that for four wins. And we, we, we had that with the win against Oklahoma, but um, last three have been tough ones. Yeah. I think we're we really still in. I, I think I think uh, we're still in play for the NIT hopes, but it's kind of like what I was talking about with football earlier is, you know, all of the games that we were right there. You know what I mean? And you can look at that as a positive and say, hey, we didn't get blown out um, really in more than one to two games uh, in the Big 12 so far. But at the same time, it's frustrating to be that close. So um, I would ahead. like to provide a little bit of hope for UCF fans, if you don't mind. Sure. So for the tournament or for for, what, for the NCAA tournament. All right, all right. I'm gonna step so back from the mic. What have I what have I talked about? What have we talked about all year when it comes to Big 12 basketball? It's just a series of opportunities that are big games, and that's what we didn't get in the American. If we're sitting here, and I think that's why we're we're talking, you know, starting to talk this way, right? We're starting to prepare ourselves that like. Well, we were we were there and we had a chance and and now with six games left in the conference slate, um, you know, we don't have that anymore. But I'll remind you with the especially with West Virginia coming up uh this two what is it, Tuesday night. I'll remind you that West Virginia made the NCAA tournament last year by winning 19 games and winning seven conference games. They won seven. They went seven for eleven in the Big Twelve last year, and they made the NCAA tournament. And one of the reasons why they did that is because they had a couple of big time ranked wins towards the end of the year. 
And of the six games remaining, three of those are against ranked teams. Two of those are against top 10 teams. And so I'm not saying that we're going to pull it off. What I'm what I am saying though with confidence is that we have a lot of opportunity in front of us that if we could clip off two or three of those wins then or three two or three more wins in conference like and th- it sets us up to have another like our further opportunity in the Big 12 tournament. So like that's what this that's what this like conference provides for us. And that's what this, to use a word that we overuse towards the beginning of the season, but we haven't used in a while. So I'm going to use it again. Is, uh, that's what the gauntlet of the big 12 also provides for us is that, and, and, and make no mistake about it. We got Texas tech, uh, Iowa state and Houston, all, all ranked teams, but good news is all three of them are at home. Yeah. Uh, the and, three the three road games that we have remaining are um, are two of the uh, two of those three are the the bottom teams in the conference and TCU is kind of the middle of the road. Uh, you never know what can happen at TCU at the end of the year. So um, I'm saying we've we've got some really good opportunity in front of us um, that this thing isn't over yet. And maybe the last if you want to look at it really, really positively over what happened over the last couple of weeks maybe if we start to pull out these wins uh over the next week like so we go two and oh this week all of a sudden we could have a totally different conversation next monday when we're recording this pod about our ncaa tournament all right i have a really really funny thing that i would say after you said that uh (laughs) that i'm going to put in the private chat but not put across the screen (laughs) Uh, but uh you know, I, to your point, for us to get to uh, 17 wins, we need to we need to win four of the remaining six. Um, so that that's a tall task. Uh, but we do have West Virginia at 7 p.m. Uh, and it's on ESPNU. Uh, so for those of you, hopefully you've got you've got the U in your in your cable package. But West Virginia is a very winnable game. We did well against them last time, but it is on the road, and they play a lot better on the road. So here's to hoping uh, we do well there. So um, I think I think that about wraps it for hoops for this week. Um, we do have a couple of things to talk about um, on the UCF football side. Uh, well, not necessarily UCF football side, but we've been talking about all the changes and all these news articles with college, uh, both college football and basketball um, that are being bandied about. And Rick Pitino actually had some suggestions for college athletics. He said, get rid of the uh, letter of intent, um, the letter, the LOIs, letter of intent, in favor of recognizing the fact that everybody's going to be on NIL deals and make them lock into an NIL deal for two years instead of, um, you know, instead of, uh, having them sign. And then also, um, you know, his, his suggestions, uh, also are about putting a salary cap right on, on NIL deals. And yes, this is basketball related, but these are some of the ideas being bandied around on the football side as well. So, um, you know, what do you guys think of, of those two ideas? Go ahead, Josh, well, or anybody. <laughs> I, I, I was going to say, I think if 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 basketball, I, I don't know if it's good or bad. I'll, I'll preface it as that. But if they could get ahead of football and kind of, if this is where we're going, get ahead of football almost to kind of stay in relevancy and not be reactive be like hey football's gonna be like hey basketball is doing it let's take them on with us if they because well i think they're branching off i ultimately i think that's what's going to end up happening it's going to turn to minor league system whether it's it's just football whether it's football and basketball whether it's all these collegiate sports just turn to the system um so so get out ahead of it um be the first ones to say hey this is what we did you know be the one to try out the the, the journeyman that, that started it um and because I think it's headed this way anyway. I mean, what 
it, it's salary cap without salary cap because we all have a certain NIL limit that we can have. We don't. There's some schools that have unlimited funds, you know, and that's eventually going to kind of like baseball. It's whoever has the most money is going to pay for the best players over time. Maybe not immediately, but just in the long haul. Um, so to protect the sport, to get ahead of it. Why not go to it? You know, why not go to that structure of salary cap, lock in guys so that you can't just jump around and go, you know, get here, collect the bag and then jump to another school that offers you a bigger bag. No, make you lock into a contract. You can't leave for two years, three years. I, I think that's what they should do. Um, so that's just me. I don't know if that's a good thing for the sport or a bad thing, but if we're going to go there, go there now, you know, try to be the first one to, to sit, lay the blueprint, in my opinion. Well, I was going to say, as long as I'm not sounding like I'm underwater. And you, do. Getting, I, you do. You do sound yeah. like that. Yeah, dude, you're, you are, you are, you're diving. Where, where's the, no, bro, where's the, uh, Josh is having technical difficulties. Uh, yeah, no, you just wanted to, uh, because, because we had that, that for you. Uh, this, you well, no, we always do it for Josh. That one yeah. is like saved in the banners for this, yeah. uh, for Josh. It, yeah, it's, it's pretty funny. Like, I know you guys can't see it on your side because you don't produce the show, but for Nobra and I, we can save the banners, and that's one we save with Josh's name on there literally the entire time. So is this any better? I mean, no, I'm no, it's, it's not. I have no. no idea what's going on. Hey, do 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 what I did when I was a kid. Just unplug it, you know. Throw I some just air into did. it. I all just right. did. You plug it back in. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. Josh, Josh, uh, the hard reboot did not work for you. So, um, you know, and for the salary cap conversation there, Trey, what he was saying is uh, cap it at one to two million because, um, you know, this this all basically goes into the other topic of of tonight, which was the transition. Um yeah, I heard that, Roger. I was like, whoa, pause. <laughs> I don't know what we we're talking about. But um, but yeah, the you know, the other part of this was there was an article that came out about uh the G5 divide. Um, and you know, there was a pretty extensive uh yeah, a pretty extensive uh you know article written from G5 coaches and how they are talking about how they can't compete anymore because all of their players, they, they even go into it. If they've got someone who's uh, – the, the comments were, if someone's over 6'5", we expect to lose them. If someone um, does well their first year, uh, we expect to lose them. Um, and, and they call themselves basically a farm league um, for, for the, 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 P, the power schools, right? So we're one of those. And then they went into it a little further and said that they expect even more, um, more of a divide – later on and 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 these are sitting head coaches at places like smu right so not not small schools like you know utep or somebody like that we're talking about smu uh head coach coming out and saying hey we can't compete here maybe we should do our own uh playoff now again they bought their way in right to the power conference but smu we all know how much money they have if they can't compete with their NIL at a G5 level, then that tells you, you know, everything that we've been talking about, about UCF's ability to recruit um, uh, with the power label holding us back, now that we've got it, uh, we can compete there. But, uh, you know, people spending one to two million just on NIL for basketball, just for NIL for basketball, right? And we all know uh, you know, the scholarships are much more limited than what they are for football. So if you extrapolate that out based on how many people play football, that's a lot of money being thrown around. So the question is, you know, if we don't uh, have some sort of legislation that kind of limits or, or places a salary cap, does the G5 survive at all? Because I think it lends more towards what Trey's talking about with a full separation. Is this inevitable at this point? Well, I think the uh, I think that whatever if they ever were to come to some sort of salary cap, it would still benefit the power five in the sense that the salary cap would be high. I don't think the salary cap is going to be low enough where it really it really would allow the the G five or whatever, you know, number you throw behind the G at the moment, uh, like 
to 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 compete anyways i mean i think this is just i think i think not to obviously we were a part of it like five minutes ago so like not to like sound <laughs> like we're uh, you know you know we're we're what we hate finally got in the club yes yeah, so and that's what i mean yeah club. like not to yeah. sound like that but like i mean but honestly like before the I mean, how many how, how many Cinderella stories really existed in the '90s? Like, like you had like when you think about when when you think about the like the like true stories of, of college football of like these great games and these bowl games that happened, like you know you know Doug Flutie throwing the hail mary and Cordell Stewart throwing the hail mary for Colorado back in the day, like like these these amazing plays that happened and like these huge runs that happened, like they didn't come out of nowhere. Like even the, even the teams, uh, the Miami teams in the eighties, like the, that the U documentaries were about, like, like it took them a couple years of like almost basically going undefeated to like get to the national championship, like where they were voted as national champions. Cause obviously we didn't have like a, true national championship game back in the 80s and 90s and so and so i guess it's just i guess the definition around it and the amount of insane amount of money around it like it like i don't well, know miami it's, 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 it's it's just you, money. it was also cocaine well yeah but, <laughs> but yeah, the, i think the smu like hearing what the smu coach or whoever is complaining ad whoever is complaining about this right it's like He's saying that we can't compete. And it's like, what's your definition of competing? Like, what's your definition of like competing? Like, like, quote unquote, competing. Because like SMU had a great he's year. Talking, he's, talking about, he's talking about competing for players and how their players, if they have a great year, all of them are getting pulled the next year. You don't you can't yeah. keep them. That's what he's yeah. talking about. And I, I hear you on that, but I remember when this, when the transfer portal really, like before NIL, like you and I, like you and I, Roger, like we would, argue, we would kind of go back and forth about this on Nightline. It's like, like, cause you would, you would, you made the rightful comment, you know, we kind of agreed to disagree that like, well, shoot, UCF's just going to become a farm system for Alabama or whatever. And I said, well, mm -hmm. Well, hold on. Like it kind of works both ways. It works both ways mm -hmm. because when the transfer portal gets more open, or the transferability of these um, these athletes gets wider open, like it, essentially, um, you know, it kind of works both ways. Where you may, yeah, maybe our leading tackler goes to goes to FSU or goes to somewhere else you know like uh one year but you at the same time you get you get the player from Alabama that that you know was a highly recruited player and out of high school and he didn't quite play his freshman year and you get that player to come to your school because uh because you know he he sees a better opportunity to play and that's what we were talking about four or five years ago and uh, and so I think that that still works both ways for the G5 as well. Um, I don't I, and I'll, I'll say this about that. I, I agree, but I feel like it was different for Cincinnati, Houston and UCF because we were still sure. high enough cachet that we were borderline P5 to begin with. Right. A lot of these teams now you look at it, I mean, you don't even hear Boise anymore. Right. And Boise for how long? No, but seriously, how long was yeah. Boise the name brand and the and the pinnacle that everybody you know, held up and as, as the example of someone yeah. who should be moved up. Right. You don't, you don't hear that anymore. Nobody, nobody looks at it. And uh, there's a lot of horse trading even within the P five for those folks. Right. Um, would Javon Baker have come to UCF? Had we not known that we were going uh, to the power conferences, you know, I, I don't know, you know, I would Kobe so. Hudson. Uh, I don't, I mean, I mean, this is, Javon Baker played one year in the Big 12. I mean, like, you know, he, he came – this was his only year in the Big 12. This is our first year. This was only one. Yeah. So, I mean, I think UCF – like like you said, Roger, I think y'all are both right. I, I think y'all are almost talking to different points because I think UCF has a brand that's bigger than most G5s. I think Cincinnati's built up a brand that's bigger than most G5s. Um, BYU a little bit, not to that extent, but like Houston, like those guys are, 
a little bit bigger brands, recognizable brands compared to, you know, FAU, Troy. you know, Troy, you know, UTEP. Like the only people that know about them are the ones that kind of go there, you know, just realistically speaking. But but like Ben said, we've gotten we're a product of having, you know, Alabama players while also losing players to Florida State, you know, losing player to Ole Miss to bigger programs. We're also the recipients of these kind of players. I, I think ultimately the talent's going to win out no matter what. Tyna, speaking to what you're talking about, the Cinderella runs, they're not really going to be Cinderella runs. I mean, in Tell football, who was it? Built for that it, way. Yeah, it, it's not. It's not. I don't think all tournament is built for. Yeah, I, I don't think. I don't. Yeah, I don't even think NFL football is built like that. I, I think yeah. it's just the best teams are going to win. Though, how do you get the best teams? You have the best coaches and the best players. You know, ultimately, now. I think our year, the 2017, we had a little, you know, our moment where we were kind of the Cinderella, but ultimately most of the time it's Alabama, Georgia. What do they have? They have a lot of money. They have great coaching. They have great talent. That's that's ultimately what normally always wins out. And Trey, I will say this uh, to that, though, the consistent uh, and, and the, the measuring stick for me is who is playing in the um, in the New Year's Six game right out of the G5 mm -hmm. and it was consistently those teams it was us oh, yeah. we played in 3 right yeah uh you had Houston and you had Cincinnati who went on their crazy run uh, I mean those were the teams when we were playing when I was playing like those were who we saw as equals in a sense you know we always knew we possibly would line now Memphis was back in but like my first couple of years it was I think we tied with Cincy my first year um for the the conference championship like that was the programs where we're like y'all want to go to the conference championship or one conference we have to go through them we got to go to houston you know we got to go to cincinnati like that was it was never really the other programs and like you said those were the teams that were getting the new year six but i remember i think houston beat fsu one year um the year they were really really good mm -hmm. um cincinnati kind of after ucf they had their little run. like you know like those were the teams that built the cachet so i think they have more name recognition but, but like to Ben saying, that was, I think that that's was also before NIL, though. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I, I think kind of like what Ben saying is just football. You're not going to see as much parity um, as far as who's going to win. I, I think I, I wish you could realistically. I think there are teams in specific time frames that could like I think our year, our UCF teams could have challenged for a national championship. I don't know how many more teams, if you look at just the, the whole scheme of say the past 20 years, can you really pinpoint a team like that? It's very few far in between. Well, um, I mean, whereas basketball, have, it, it's a lot of the time because you're it's round after round after round where, you know, you any did. one game you can get that upset. Trey, you did. I mean, you had Boise, right? Boise was one. Um, but yeah. like the, the whole point that I'm trying to make, I think, goes more to the point of there's nobody, no brands left that are going to consistently be in the running for that playoff spot, right? And all these these players that are borderlines that are considering going down to the G5, right, would be okay with playing for UCF or Cincinnati or Houston or someone because they're more than likely, and it was all American teams, right, mm -hmm. that uh, were more um, were likely to get that exposure that a New Year's Six game uh, provides. Oh yeah, to, for sure. to do that kind of stuff, right? For sure. You know, Tulane had a had a run the last couple of years too. But are they going to be able to do that consistently? No. UCF has. We did it in 2013. We did it in 2017. We did it in 2018. And the expectation in 2019, uh, you know, we did pretty well in yeah, 2019. In 2022, yeah. I, th yeah. I think that whole stretch. Yeah, so that that I don't think there's any teams or brands left that are going to be able to do that. And with NIL now e rearing its ugly head, um, they can afford one or two players that might be difference makers for them, but they can't build a team around that. And I don't think they're going to be, there won't be anybody that will consistently, even if they keep the playoff spot for the G5 into the new contract after the next couple of years, which there's questions about that. Right? I don't think they are. I don't know. It depends on if they want to, if, if I think it depends on if the rest of the NCAA teams allow the power teams to have their way because that was basically what that spot was to begin with was it was basically a, a bribe for mm -hmm. uh after the big east went to the eight uh went to the aac and we're going to have their auto bid pulled 
that was basically a bribe to stay relevant. And, uh, you know, part of what we were talking about last week or a couple of weeks ago was now, you know, the, the, what they traded for the autonomy, they gave, they gave the power teams autonomy, which is what gives them the power status. Right. And they also yeah. gave them votes that were worth more. They were weighted more than what the rest of the G5 teams were. I don't think they do that this time. They've already got that. So what, what leverage does the G5 have at this point to have their way? And the only thing that I can think of is the tax implications. And I think that's going away because there's still some congressional uh, stuff, some uh, legal stuff that's happening in the background as well, where, you know, we had the unionization that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. It's, it's going to be, and we were talking about running the NALs through the schools now directly instead of having these uh, offshoots, right? It's going to be a situation where, um, all of that, all of that comes into play where they're just not going to be able to compete. And I think, you know, what Patino said with putting a salary cap in in there, that's the only way that you're going to be able to compete, even with the power four, right? Within the power four, the Big Ten and SEC versus the Big 12 and ACC. And I don't think the ACC is going to be out there long. So, um, you know, I, 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 I really... I really feel it's not just them. I think there's going. I think there's going to be a power three, and I um and you know the power three will be the buckets that will draw enough eyeballs, you know, for for uh, Fox and ESPN to make it worth their while, right? But they're not going to be paid the premium brands and what the premium brands get. That's what I think you're seeing right now, and I don't but, see any G five team that's going to be able to do that, and that's going to affect. I think I think like you're I think I, I think Ben alluded to it earlier too. It is the salary cap, you know, two million across the board for every theme. I, I think that keeps it competitive. Now, if the salary cap's 25, 30 million across the board, well, <laughs> you know, SMU's not really gonna pay that out. Alabama's gonna pay that out, Texas is gonna pay that out, but the other so ultimately you're still gonna have it, it's gonna be like baseball where Hey, there's no salary cap, but only a few owners really want to spend unlimited money, and some of them are just penny pinching. You know, like it's going to turn into that. So I'll remind everybody what NIL stands for: name, image, and likeness. And this is the reason why. This is the reason why the salary cap is. It might happen because they might go like they might say, okay, so. We're going to bring everything out into the open. The schools are going to pay the players directly. And the, pay, the, the money that they pay the players directly, yes, we're going to institute a salary cap on that. But because of the way the system has been set up over the first few years of existence and the fact that it is is saying that these athletes can make money off of their name, image, and likeness, it doesn't matter what the schools do because Alabama will say, great, you gave me my, you gave me my two and a half million dollar uh, salary cap. I decided to give, get pay these players directly, but it isn't going to stop the booster because of the way the system set up and it won't change. It can't change. It can't change. It doesn't stop the booster that owns the car dealership that decides he wants to pay the quarterback 500,000, yeah. For that, to play for that season and that's the deal that those two individuals have on the side like endorsements it is it is yeah, the, the new it, legislation it the, money the chiefs pay travis kelsey versus the money that he makes from uh, you know insert uh, you know advertisement here yeah, uh, yeah. you know whatever I mean, that's what tom brady did too i mean i, right. I agree with what you're mm -hmm. saying but it, 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 it's so, it, so that's the reason why the salary cap actually doesn't make a difference because the schools will still be able to pay these players whatever the heck it takes to get them to go there. Um, and so that's the unfortunate reality. Um, I But I will go back to one thing, though, that I do like the thought process behind. And um, and that is and that is that is. Um, the idea of a player being able to sign a multi-year contract with a school um yeah. where where letter of intent right now is all one-year deals right scholarships not all of them 
Not all of them are all one year deals for the most part in Division One athletics. No. Yes. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, at was, least I remember Coach O'Lear literally. Yeah, he told us. Every- he told us, and he was like, "Listen, if you guys don't perform, you don't. You're not guaranteed your scholarship for four years. Even though you're on a four year scholarship, you're not guaranteed that scholarship. It's only one year. Right. So, so you just, have to continue performing. So since it's essentially professional, you know, professional mm-hmm. athletics. I mean, that's what it is. Um, I like the idea of of certain athletes seeing the benefit uh, and certain institutions seeing the benefit of trying to sign someone to a multi year deal and making and making that worth it for them that they have them to a multi year deal and they have to hold up that end of the contract and if you want to get out of that contract there's there's financial implications for that and all that. Um, I like the idea of that, and that would be where a union would be extremely uh, valuable. A players' union would be extremely valuable for that. And that, but I also like the idea of saying, you know, an athlete saying, like a top tier athlete saying, you know, doing the LeBron James model and saying, I'm going to bet on myself, and I'm going to, I'm going to sign a one year deal to provide me flexibility to get out of this at the end of the year. Um, and move on to another school or re-sign for more money with this school. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, and so I like the idea of just kind of pulling back the veil and saying, you know, guys, let's, this is professional sports. And so we're going to model these contracts after professional sports. But the last thing you're going to have to do though, is you're going to have to, you're going to have to, you're going to have to maintain um, the, the years of eligibility um staying with five years to play four or six years to play four uh, uh, unless there's unless there's extenuating circumstances because I think the temptation over time with that is that why wouldn't you want to just if it's just a professional model why wouldn't you just want to directly compete and and keep a Caleb Williams at USC for seven eight nine years if he's going to benefit you from that like I mean look at Look at the popularity, uh, and this is something that was talked about on radio locally uh, here uh, with Mark Daniels. But like, look at the popularity of Caitlin Clark at Iowa, right? Like, I mean, she's yeah. benefited because she's been at. She's not only a phenomenal player, but she's built up her name recognition over six years at Iowa. So, like, I mean, so that's another thing that it'll be interesting to see what happens as a next step if we move in this direction. Is who's going to be the first athlete that challenges? eligibility years and the amount of years that they can get um they can be out of school and compete out of school because that that could be the next uh you know shoot a drop in lawsuits against the ncaa to try to get try to change some sort of rules that have been around forever well it'll be it'll certainly be interesting uh and a conversation that we're going to continue to have because this is an evolving conversation right uh both Uh, from the NIL front and and legally and uh, a bunch of other different avenues. That's However, awesome. we are at two hours and 22 <laughs> minutes and four seconds. So um, let's go ahead and move forward with uh, Alan's oxymoronic stat of the week. Alan, well, I only have, yeah, I only have one here. We talked about um, how... UCF scored a lot in that BYU game. Um, really one of their top scoring performances of the season and uh, by far their best in Big 12 play. They had a couple uh, points games in the 90s in non-conference play, but they actually scored uh, 63 points in the second half, which would be more than six other games total this entire season for the entirety of the game. They were able to outscore that in the second half alone against BYU the other day. Interesting. That's a crazy stat to think about. That's a hell of a pace that they were able to keep up with BYU on that in that 63 points. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah a lot of those on turnovers, that defense uh, making offense. Um, all right, uh, Josh, I, I know yeah. you said earlier that Joey may have, uh, have stolen your thunder <laughs> here, but do you have a sometimes funny fact of the week? Yeah, I, I it's not a uh, NBA based uh, All Star Weekend scoring thing like Allen, um, but yeah, you know I, I changed it up a little bit. We had Joey Joey Connors on the show, and he's now the special teams analyst at Mississippi State. 
So let's talk about just assistant football coach roles and higher, you know, uh, OCs, you know, DCs, head coaches, etc. What percentage of current Mississippi State coaches were formerly working at UCF from that level and up? Ooh, that's interesting. Uh, that was loud. That was. Uh, so I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say. 48. No, I'm going to say 57%. Okay. Let's I'm going to say 40%. Alan? 55. 46. Ben? 55%. Ooh, Alan is the, as the statistician is the closest to the pin. 45%. 45% of Assistant mind. head coaches and up were former UCF coaches. Uh, Cliff Odom, and, and he left the most of them, not all full names. Cliff Odom, Jeff Levy, obviously, Corey Bell, and that was a name when I started looking. Oh wow! At the list. I, 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 yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I, he, he, he did some good things, right? <laughs> yeah, he's um, good. I like him. Yeah, and uh, we have uh, Anthony uh, Tucker. And John Cooper was the, uh, John Cooper is the other one that I, I was like, I remember this name. So I started looking into them and it's a lot. <laughs> so yeah, 45%, uh, five out of 11 of the assistant head coaches and up uh, are all former, formerly on UCF payroll. In addition, on the way down, there's probably more, but there's a lot of uh, quality assistant, uh, you know, uh, uh, analysts and assistants and uh, QC and all that stuff stuff so uh yeah all right. it, it's so, a lot so mississippi state is ucf north all right um guys that uh that'll do it for that this week josh do you want to take us home with the quick update on other ucf sports although most of it was rained out over the weekend yeah, yeah. So rain was our biggest opponent for the last couple of weeks. Uh, but in raw reality, so we had UCF baseball. They won their season opener 12-11 over Bryant and then almost got a game two in, but really didn't. And then in the Orlando area, mostly in Florida, it rained for about 50 some odd hours straight. It was very odd. So the rest of that series was rained out. They'll play Miami. Well, maybe today, depending on when you listen to this, but tomorrow as we record, but we're getting close to midnight. So I'm going to be there. Uh, ooh. Oh, nice. ooh. I, might, I might, I might give coach about two or three innings on the mound. That, you know hey, what? Well, get, you better, you better go it. talk to Coach Wallace. You better go talk to him. <laughs> I am. A I'm a talk, I need to, I need to get my jerseys. I need to get the the light blue uh, Citronaut hey. throwback hat, and then see, I gotta see if, can, see if you can scoop me a hat. Man. See if you can scoop me a hat because they're Roger. Just... See, you, you keep on trying to jump me first with the tickets and now with the hat. <laughs> I, I gotta get this stuff you first. Can scoop me. I didn't say you didn't have to get uh, you get one to ask him for two. One for me, one for you. We said it on the air when he was on the interview. So There there are uh, three other people in, in, in this conversation. Right <laughs> yeah, so, so we're having this conversation. I'm just saying. We're, I, I you got to jump like in there. Here. You got to jump um, in there. Both UCF feet. softball went two and one last week. They beat Liberty seven to five, but lost to UNC two to one. And they beat oh, Wisconsin 21 to 9. I can't believe Man, they that gave game up was nine crazy, runs. too. Oh my gosh. Man. 21 to 9. And the last three games are canceled due to weather. Uh, yep. UCF women's hoops, they unfortunately are like the men's hoops teams losing close games. They lost to BYU 64 60. And man, the Kansas State game, they were so close, too. And that, they ranked like 14th or something, something really high. Unfortunately, they also lost 60 to 58. Another two point loss for a basketball team at UCF. Uh, now, men's tennis were undefeated until they suffered their first loss of the season to the Gators. It was a six-one loss. It was it, it it was here's the thing. It was close in a lot of areas, but kind of like the basketball team couldn't get over the top across the board. Now we also had our women's tennis team who also lost a little bit. This is why I'm not wearing a collar this time uh, because we didn't do too much winning. Um, they lost to Tennessee 0-4 uh, and lost to Wisconsin 4-2. Uh, so it's been just not the 
best time for UCS sports, uh, except for baseball, and we we have some time. Um, and I will say, if you are a track and field fan, the track and field championships are coming up this weekend, and a lot of other interesting games are happening too. All right, awesome. Thank you for that update. Uh, just uh, for clarity, if uh, if you're talking about Wisconsin, it's usually denoted as whiskey, not Wisco, as it was in the short show notes this week. Thank so, you. I, uh, I you could put anything in front of me and I'll read it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh my gosh, it was like I, Ben, Ben, and Trey. If you guys remember from the uh, from the days of the of Nightline, uh, I always had a good time giving Andrew the hard names to say. Oh yeah. Uh, for, for, <laughs> So, yeah, I, all right, guys. Well, that that was a, that was a heck of an episode. We learned about uh, another layer of Josh. Uh, he's <laughs> going to have to serenade us at some point. He's really opened the door now. He's going to be uh, starting his show with uh, freestyle raps. And uh, you know, on top of that, we also had a great interview with uh, yeah. UCF legend uh, Joey Connors. Um, you know, we we have Trey every week, but uh, it was fun to listen to them rap. Got a few new stories out there that I hadn't heard before. So um, other than that, uh, have a great week. I'm uh, I'm excited for this week. I'll be in town um, and uh, go Knights and charge on. charge on. So I could do some singing afterwards. Maybe that's like the ending of the episode. We just 